didn't carry them. Um, before I start my presentation, before I start my presentation, I would like to say a few words uh, on some issues raised yesterday. First is, I'm not a representative of the Arab world. Second, I feel your frustration regarding the lack of participation from the Arab design community. However, describing this as this lack of participation as self-imposed isolation is difficult to accept. In the shadow of the wall, or in the shadow of the wall, clearly visible from here, being constructed today. This strikes me as an interesting juxtaposition. Um, who are my clients and where is my community? Prologue. Thank you for inviting me to be here today in Jerusalem to talk about Mediterranean regional design. I have to admit that when I first heard the words region and Mediterranean together, I cringed. Mediterranean. I remember being a little girl and watching the Mediterranean Sea from the balcony of our apartment in Beirut. At the age of four, looking through the balcony railing, I asked my brother what he thought lay beyond that horizon. Region. We imagined a number of possibilities, and after much debate, decided that beyond the horizon line must be a big, powerful, all-encompassing waterfall. In 1975, at the onset of the Lebanese civil wars, I boarded a tiny fishing boat called Tanya and headed towards Cyprus, seeking temporary refuge. Hours passed. Partly excited and partly scared, I waited and waited and waited impatiently for the big waterfall, the mother of all falls. I was four, and my horizon kept distance. We never reached the Great Falls. Fifteen years later, at the end of the war, I left the Middle East. As I flew, as I flew over the Mediterranean, it never occurred to me that I was crossing a line that would remain the focus of my thoughts for the rest of my life. Today, 14 years later, I find myself living on the other side of that thin, shifty, deceptive line, crisscrossing it every now and then. I imagine that that line is somewhere deep in the Mediterranean Sea, the line between my past and my present, my distant memories and future desires. I'm not four years old anymore, but I am still seeking the mother of all falls, seeking to find a balance, a convergence of all the identities that I have acquired, or that have been assigned to me. Program. As an individual, an Armenian-Lebanese woman, the idea of a Mediterranean region has deep meaning for me. It could stand as the fulcrum of my being, the vanishing point of my perspective, the cherished object of my desire. However, I am also a designer, one who understands the implications of this conference. At its best, I recognize its potential to draw together a coalition of nationalities thinkers and practitioners under the common flag of design. At its worst, I recognize the potential of this program to impose a manufactured homogeneity over a culturally rich, linguistically diverse, and politically explosive area of the world. Where else, if not here, can we see so black and white the divisions between us? Where else but here exists the potential for reaching across so deep a divide? Yes, we are all aware of the dangers associated with such a program in such a region. A discussion about design does not have to be autobiographical. However, a discussion about Mediterranean regional design held in Jerusalem in 2004 can be as perilous an adventure of myth-making as Hollywood Westerners were to the settling of the Wild West. And so how do we proceed with such a program? Do we attempt in this conference to territorialize this region as one entity? Is it possible to bring together as diverse a group of peoples as exists here under a common geopolitical or geoesthetic banner? Or rather, as I have come to believe, as strongly as my feelings for my lost horizon, that it would be better to see the Mediterranean region as a composite of many territories and diverse ethnicities, and this conference as a gathering among neighbors. 
who are not afraid to be themselves and argue and embrace as their desire directs them. After all, we are not regionalists here, we are designers. As designers, we can address the issues at hand. How can we resist the homogenizing forces that we, we all experience every day, both professionally and privately? What is the potential for this conference to share a strategy to withstand the globalization encroaching on all sides, or perhaps predominantly from one side? How do designers from this region who now live abroad and have, come, have become composites themselves respond and express this diverse background and the personal adaptability it has borne in us? Identification. Who they say I am. Recently, during a discussion with some friends regarding a movie called Control Room, a documentary about the Middle East news agency Al Jazeera and its reporters, I heard an all too familiar comment saying that the reporters portrayed seemed to be surprisingly westernized. When I asked my friend what he meant by that, he answered, well, I mean like you are, westernized. Who I think I am. Born in Lebanon of Armenian parents, my Armenian parents came from Syria, their Armenian parents came from Anatolia, now in Turkey. I am an Armenian born and raised in Lebanon. I immigrated to Canada and am now living in New York. Lebanon is the fulcrum of the scale of my experience, the fulcrum of my being. <coughs> Lebanon is a dream space through which my family's history passes, from which my personal history springs. I am diasporan. Every region, every boundary, every citizenship, every memory slips under the slightest pressure of attention. Definitions blur and become undefined. The distinctive becomes indistinct. The diaspora by nature contradicts and challenges concepts of citizenship and nationhood. I find myself to be provisionally national, by which I mean that I am currently accepted as a citizen of at least one nation state. Simultaneously, and perhaps as a result of this, I am conditionally political, by which I mean that I am currently subject to at least one state's political system, even if my political identity is directed at my horizon permanently fixed in the Mediterranean. In short, as a geopolitical construct, I am in a permanent state of slippage. My cultural specificity, specificity is omitted, ignored, discarded, homogenized, and I cease to exist. This is the ground from which I spring. This identity is an important situation that describes the core of my existence as an individual and later as a designer. It is the lens offered to me through which I view the world and through which I evaluate my role in the Armenian community, in the place I was born, in the world at large that I live in today. Or as I like to say, I am on a 100 year tour. Tell me what year it is and I will tell you who I am. I would like to add to the trajectory developed by the world travelers and seekers of adaptability. The diaspora and the exile that displaced often do not choose to do so. A diasporic community carries with it a sense of loss and the impossibility of return. The diaspora, in this sense, doesn't have a history. It lives a catastrophe that is constantly being defined and redefined. The region of the diaspora, to quote the late Edward Said, is, quote, outside habitual order. It is nomadic, decentered, contrapunto. But no sooner one gets accustomed to it than its unsettling forces erupt anew, end quote. I believe in remaining a diasporan. The diasporan shares a symbiotic relationship with her client culture. On the one hand, she and the diaspora as a whole is dependent on her history, culture, and place of origin within this client culture. On the other hand, she plays a clear or key role in the renewal and expansion of the respective culture in which she lives. She engages with the client culture and by doing so changes it and is changed by it. For me, Armenian is bigger than Armenia, and Middle Easterner bigger than the Middle East. I believe in this hybrid sense of self. Modernity and disarticulation. War and immigration, displacement, dislocation, and loss are leading me to disarticulation. A looming silence presses down on me at all times. I seek a clearer understanding of this hybrid self, its expressions and possibilities, <coughs> as a way to articulate a design vision that will hold back the impending dissolution of my being at the hands of a faceless, colorless, odorless universality. Faced with globalization and its homogenizing program, I, I propose to reinterpret what are terms its universal and international styles in design. I am proposing to replace them with the heterogeneous and the hybrid 
an amalgam not of global and local, but an embodiment of simultaneous multiplicity. In the early 20th century, modernism developed as an attitude in response to conditions similar to today. At that time, artists and designers sought a differential voice that could express a unifying principle that would cut through the rampant nationalist tendencies of the day. Utopian in aspiration, modernism sought to create a movement beyond sectarian division and warfare through the dissemination of machine aesthetic, aesthetic intentionally stripping away individuality in the name of a wholesome homogeneity, more or less universally believed to be embodied by science and technology. The new way of thinking was an escape from the complexities and diversities of the traditional systems of values, which are partially blamed for the fractious political realities that contributed to two world wars. Beauty as the absolute moral value was seen as bankrupt. Art is the arbiter, as the arbiter of moral truth was rejected. Art for art's sake stated that art needed to remain subservient to man's need, but rather should lead in a new direction, did not lead in it. To, the, to that utopia just over the horizon in search of the great mother of a waterfall, which even a four-year-old could be seduced by. This was a shift from art imitates life to art imitates art to, art, to life imitates art. <coughs> The world wars were the catalyst for this shift, a loss of communal identity and increased reliance on industrialization and a desire to break from the past were attitudes normalized by the post-war development of the forces of reparation, repatriation, redistricting, remapping, and nationalization. The local became the national and the national was a mere expression of the new globalism of which the war itself was cause, proof and validation. Modernism's trajectory from utopian ideology through its triumphal propagation in the post-World War II world as the international style to its current status within architecture and other disciplines as the final expression of the repressive tendencies of a fully formed globalization is a matter of history now. Regardless of its origins, this universalizing style has become the direct opponent of everything that is representative of the handmade and the local. Even today, societies tend to abandon local materials and methods and adopt the foreign, the international, in the belief that this will grant them admittance to the political and economic utopia of modernity. Mass production has not only succeeded in replacing traditionally produced artifacts, but it has also silenced and displaced the cultural symbolism inherent in them. The traditional artifact is mass produced now as an item of nostalgia or sometimes mockery. Unfortunately, as I move further from my place of birth, this universality is moving in the opposite direction, like a riptide towards the place I left. It is creating the aspirants of those who stay home. Beirut has, gone many dis many destruction, has undergone many destructions and much reconstruction. Do the Beirutis today, who never immigrated from Lebanon, recognize the lately reconstructed Beirut? Several art and cultural institutions have organized exhibitions and conferences in Lebanon where a large number of the participants were members of the Lebanese diaspora. Returning to Lebanon occasionally, their primary concern has been an effort to understand its history in relation to the realities on the ground. Many of them talk about the civil wars not as a catastrophe in the past, but as a catastrophe in the present. They engage in the act of collecting information, archiving, and juxtaposing it with memories, observations of daily life, against the moral imperative of recognizing one's past. Beirut is seen to have, is seen to have erased its past by dumping it into the Mediterranean Sea. Beirut, therefore, is an imaginary place. The tendency of today's diasporic Lebanese artists is to point out and to map, through a process of archiving, what has become an <coughs> unrecognizable, unrealistic place one that has come under the utopian spell of developers who equated with commercial success. Regarding graphic design, Sherry Blackenship, who teaches in Lebanon, writes, despite the influences of globalization, there are the beginnings of awareness about the need to address local needs with their own particular visual language inspired by visual traditions. This is, this is, this is the hard part, since with all the negative media attention, many people here want to deny or ignore their traditions. They have also been dramatically affected by French colonization and the more recent Americanization, <coughs> end quote. In an article called Between Heaven and Hell, Contempor Contemporary Art from the Middle Eastern Diaspora, Niri Melkonian asks, how does the Middle Eastern diasporic artist operate with memory and belonging versus not belonging? What kind of hybrid and conflicting identities are mitigated to their art? 
When does the tension between global and ro local reconcile? She claims that what distinguishes transnationalism from previous internationalist movements in the arts is that it challenges the alleged hegemony and homogeneity of an international style while transporting the notion of ethnic beyond descriptions of cultural diversity. As a designer and part of the Lebanese diaspora, I too am concerned with the meaning of what I make. Having been displaced out of necessity, the struggle to find meaning becomes central. However, I realize that no passerby is going to simply hand that meaning to me. I will have to make sense of who I am and where I, where I was and where I am and find a process that processes exactly that. As much as my own history of location and dislocation influences me to pursue a design philosophy centered around the idea of a hybrid cultural self and a culturally responsive yet broad heterogeneity, I do not need to rely on my experience al alone. Similar models already exist in Middle Eastern tra tradition. Mateos pointed out yesterday that the idea of flexible, multi-use dwellings and furnishings has deep roots in the dis disparate cultures of the Middle East and the Mediterranean. So in an ironic uh, circle of events, time, circumstances, and politics, I arrive at a lifestyle much familiar to my distant ancestors. This is the tradition that I look to for inspiration and guidance. The fact that this tradition exists globally as well as locally encourages me further. So I ask, is this a newly revised local globalism or global localism? Once again, who are my clients and where is my community? And let us add the question, what is my community? Methodology. The thin line deep in the Mediterranean, the horizon I crossed so long ago, the one that stands between my past and my present calls to me. It compels my focus. It is the place where I go to exercise my creative process. As a metaphor, the horizon describes an ever-present, ever-receding nexus of design possibilities surrounding a particular project at hand. It represents the opening up of fabulous perspectives through research, exploration, experimentation, and dialectics. Here, all my baggage has a chance to come out of the bag and act freely. It is a multilingual, multicultural space, the place where my client cultures all express themselves as shared experiences. It is a contemporary and expressive space infatuated with contemporary materials and processes passionate about Armenian Lebanese symbolism, curious towards the other. I think of this space as third space, in contrast to the first space of tradition and the second space of my client culture. I am aware that other writers and thinkers use this term to describe a formalized spatial dynamic. Whether or not my notions fall neatly into their systems or not does not concern me. My ideas are messy and conditional. Projects and concerns. The perspective within my third space reveals to me the impossibility of designing the quintessential object, the archetypal object. All objects become non-typical. Nature or essence does not hold in any one object. I cannot strive to capture some quintessence of a program. Imminence eludes my work as it has my identity. Perfect geometries have no meaning. I cannot imagine perfection as an exclusionary objectivity. All perfections, all geometries, all materials strive to include all points of reference from my experience. My design language cannot describe the frozen moment of some platonic ideal. There is simply no singular point of reference for me to apply. Objects have twofold purpose, spaces exchange use. The outcome overlaps the boundaries of fashion, furniture, and architecture. Now we will go, we will see some examples of our work, which is me and my partner Jorge Prado. Uh, and we hope that this will give a taste of this.
Okay. <clears throat> so here are some examples of the work that we do. Um, folding. These are. This is the following. Will be stool studies uh, about folding one piece of material until it becomes structural. Um, okay. meant to be a stool. <laughs> uh, so here are some uh, studies with uh, folding metal to arrive at that shape. Um, this is another folding example, uh, a bag prototype. Um, here we try not to use any stitches or glues and it can, uh, it can fold in different ways, it takes different shapes and could possibly have more than one side. Here's one example, a drawing. <coughs> um, folding for metal furniture, folding metal. This stool has two heights, um, and there are some studies of again stool studies using folding with folding metal, uh, wood furniture, slots, slots. Is, so folding is one, slots is another idea um, where the object can be totally collapsed. And the slotting design, which I'm not showing, uh, makes the structure uh, strong. In this one, we, we, we like the idea of incorporating tablecloth and table together. So the slots at the, at the top uh, take, the, uh, take the tablecloth, slides into it. But the tablecloth is not designed yet. <laughs> Here it is in a collapsed form. Uh, this is a design for a bed. Um, this is another design for, it's a very simple one, four boxes that uh, also for use, use as a bed, but they can, they can come together in different shapes or forms, as you can see here. Um, quick examples. Layering, this, uh, the following will show an experiment. <laughs> taking apart the chair. <laughs> this is a table made out of many different layers and it has receptacles that can be removed uh, for washing and, and placed back. Um, the, the structure was a found uh, object. This is another one. Oh, casting out. This is an idea that we, we like to pursue um, using existing bowls and uh, casting it in such a way that the inside of the bowl becomes the outside of the bowl. And the other one that we'll show is using uh, you know, found objects to use for, as formwork, uh, one of them being bubble wrap. Um, so here you see that the outside becomes inside and the inside becomes outside. This is the one with the bubble wrap. Environment. Um, these are some architectural projects we've done where we overlap certain functions. Um, in the first one, we, we designed a bed that's also a light fixture. So when the bed mattress comes over, it covers some of the light and emanated into the room. It's a very basic thing. <coughs> Double function. Also, this is a, um, a bench we designed for a lobby in New York. Uh, it's also a bench and a light fixture at the same time. 
dual occupancy. Um, here we try to design a, a space for uh, as as a living space and as a theater at the same time. We inserted a glass box um, and a platform for a bedroom. The platform then becomes the stage. Um, this is a project we're doing right now. It's not finished. Uh, it's um, it's the clients. One is a mathematician. The other one is a theatrical director. So we designed it in such a way that we, the office becomes the platform uh, as a stage for the theatrical director. Um, it's under construction, so you're not gonna That's the stage. Rock House. Um, this is a project we did a while back while we were traveling in India. Um, we decided that the rocks would become our, <coughs> our clients. Um, and we, dis we, we found rocks on the slopes of hills and we, dis we, we, we wanted to work with them and decided that we would like to lift the rocks and re-energize it and release it back into the, into the landscape. So these houses are meant to collapse. Um, this is a photogram uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, I think captures uh, what we would like to have, what we, we would like the rock to uh, acquire. <laughs> Some drawings. The landscape of rock houses. Redirected Messages is a project that my partner is engaged in where, we, where he collects uh, um, advertisement posters um, and we perceive a certain message in them and we, we, we work with the object at hand and we, we, we redirect the message and release them back into the... we put them back in the bins for re redistribution. Um, so let me see. Uh, this is an advertisement for a musician, and here we see the musician as sex spot. Um, this is the back of the card. Here, uh, Sculpt the Body, Try the Mind. A, there are, these are two cards that are combined. The tattooed man as exemplar of prison culture and also troped as fine leather. Prison glory feminized and rehabilitated for our consumption. These are the two cards. Here, the muscular, muscularly fit woman becomes crab-like mollusk. Um, better posture, better prospects. We turn that to posture better, better prospects. <laughs> this is a, a MoMA, a MoMA a card for MoMA, where we work with the idea of repeating the image until it redirects the message and becomes the love goddess. Uh, board. <laughs> Join already. This is advertisement for, I guess, the social circles. It's a singles club. <laughs> Join the cards together. In the back. And that's it. Um, when I was approached by uh, one um, municipality, which was uh, 6.15 in the morning in London, a phone call that... Uh, um, woke me up and said, um, hello, we're from Fulon in Hebrew, and uh, we've been uh, suggested to contact you and we would like to invite you to talk about the idea of writing a program for a design museum. It's amazing. <laughs> and uh, in the first meeting there, um, I realized that they're serious. I mean, the, I, I entered the office and one of the first things I saw on the wall was a... a a building of uh, Bilbao, and I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> this is probably not the only uh, uh, municipality in the world thinking about a uh, landmark museum that will change that economy and put them on the map. And uh, um, When I went in, I was surprised and uh, relieved to find uh, people that were uh, really thinking about uh, um, a popular um, museum, but uh, we're aware of the pitfalls and working together with them, uh, we decided to set off on this uh, uh, research stage and that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, more about the research, where it took me, the ideas that came out of it, the proposal, 
uh, of a museum that I think could work here and maybe in other places. Um, from that, translating that into an architectural brief, which was given um, to uh, the architects. And maybe through this, and for me, the, the exciting thing about being here is that if this project actually happens, and so many people are involved in it, um, in, in a way it's crucial that people are involved in it, because as uh, in the introduction by Ido uh, yesterday, it is about people. And uh, we are talking through design, and um, there's an opportunity here very early in our uh, industrial and national industrial design life to start something that will actually grow and reflect uh, identity through material culture. Um, so that's sort of the order of the things I'll go through. Um, there's quite a lot, so please, if you can tell me when half an hour is over, I'll stop and jump to the last slide. <laughs> You have about 27 minutes. Okay. So, um, the research, being a product designer, I sort of try to understand the concept in terms of looking at the place, looking at the time, and looking at the opportunities here. Um, this is a structure that I know from more from design education or planning a new institute for a design education, looking at what the place is um, in terms of time, what's happened before, what's uh, what people are looking for, and in terms of opportunities, uh, really looking at what's going on now and can happen and who can talk to who and what can... Uh, and I think this is a sort of way of looking at context at product design. Um, uh, another aspect before I just go into this is that um, my, my primary interest in this project was actually to do with uh, writing briefs. And um, I think a good brief suggests action, acknowledges possible sources and suspends judgment um, and in that sense this was a brief that uh, is hope this is a brief that is hoping to inspire the architects the management the curators the people the designers and uh, so first thing was to look at uh, museums and the role of museum as it's perceived today by big institutes that are directors, director, museum directors, conferences, and how they define what the role of a museum is today. One of the fears expressed by the client was to do with uh, the perception of museums, the, the idea of people shying away from coming to a museum just because it's a museum. So, and that's not true. I mean, the, the industry of museums is flourishing, and there's a, endless museums starting up, so there must be something there more than the, that perception. Um, then looking at what it is that a, a museum does so, and the responsibilities that uh, you take on when you call yourself a museum. One of the problems being that in this case the museum is not starting with a collection. Many museums start from the point that they have a significant collection, uh, decorative art or commercial industrial or some personal collection, someone interested like in the Welcome Foundation in uh, medical history. In this case, we're starting from a situation where um, there is no collection. So can it be a museum? And in terms of national um, responsibility, this isn't declared as a national museum. So maybe at this stage, that's not a problem. But could it aspire to become one? And is this a beginning, a good beginning for something that could become um, a national museum? And that brought on the question of, uh, is it a museum of Israeli design, or is it a museum for design in Israel? Uh, that was the, sort of the biggest conversation at the beginning. Um, this proposal uh, suggests that it's, first of all, a design museum. It's in Israel, and therefore it, uh, of course, has to uh, take a very supportive and uh, interested look at Israeli activity. But I'm weary of saying Israeli design at this point. So design museums and museums, um, the buildings around the world are becoming more and more sort of active containers, much more dominant and uh, uh, taking part in the identity of the museum beyond 
the declaration of the authority. So we have traditional big traditional museums that were built in a sense to create a, a very strong authoritative uh, encyclopedic approach. Uh, whereas today we're beginning to see, or in the last sort of uh, more uh, expressive uh, architecture, that at times the impact on the interiors is problematic. So that was something to think about. Uh, I started by looking at different places and uh, comparing them uh, to the, which type of museum. What kind of type of museum would suit Israel? And sort of locating them between fine art and industry, between science and popular commercial culture. Then visiting them, writing down, creating a sort of museum profile, that's the black bit in the middle, uh, to every visit, uh, noting down highlights, things I like, things, uh, looking if the mission statement and the program were compatible, uh, what was the role of the collection, trying to uh, define curatorial approaches, seeing if there is a type of museum that suits Israel and is there a curatorial approach that suits this type of museum and how would it change. So this is part of the visit, picking up. It's very tempting to make a shopping list and say, oh, we'll have that aquarium and a very nice staircase and we'll have this kind of storage. And, um, and then this whole uh, issue of what happens inside came up. Okay, so maybe the way to define what a museum should be is by what it does. Um, so I looked at the traditional museum activity and one of the requests of the client was to look very closely at what a professional resource center would do. So again, this question came up, uh, is it a museum for professionals, for designers, for industry, or is it a public, general public museum? And could it be a joint venture? What, are the, what is the balance? Um, on the right-hand side, you see a, a part of the suggestion, which is um, what could happen in this uh, model. And that has to react to things or pick on things that are happening in the museum world. So um, we looked at trends in exhibiting objects, how objects are exhibited. Again, for professionals or in general public, um, looking at how audience is evolving very much what they are expecting of a new museum in terms of entertainment, in terms of education. Um, and uh, what is the opportunity here? So the thing that was very evident that a lot of museums are moving away from the object on the podium or the picture on the white wall and involving a lot of narrative um, methodology and mechanisms. And so the green area is sort of identifying where we might like to be. And the big, the big question that sort of arose from this was, what is the story of design? If we are to be talking about a story, um, or telling the history through story, uh, what is the story of design? And at this point I would like to suggest a definition, which for me was a working definition, which uh, design is a, is a utopia of uh, improvement. Um, then, looking at each museum, trying to uh, identify the footprint of a museum. So before we were looking at the type, let's say the family name, surname. And in this case, this is the private, uh, the personal name of the museum. So each of these, this was set up to sort of understand uh, what this new museum should uh, be interested in, really. And in a, in a country, in a country like the United Kingdom, the, there are museums that take an interest in a, uh, c they can allow themselves to direct to a very particular, uh, for instance, the Craft Council, or uh, if you look at the V&A, their interests are different and they can project that through their mission, through their collection, and through their exhibitions. And if you look at Vitra, then for instance, it started very much as an industry led a commercial venture, but their commitment to education in the last years has changed a lot and their footprint is evolving. So now comes the stage where, you look, where we looked at uh, uh, locally, uh, in terms of uh, anticipating that this brief might be given to uh, designers abroad that might not know the, the context. Um, I think 
picking up on uh, particularly the last uh, element of the cultural differences in perception. Um, and this ties in with what Silva was talking about, this uh, line in between this area. And I think we, Israel is located in an area or has the opportunity to see what happens when the Occident and the Orient meet, what happens between the sort of professional design as a corporate tool approach, which is typified by sort of companies like IDEO that we know and appreciate here in Israel, and um, the other approach, which is design as a, as, a, as a way of life. It's more holistic, more sort of Italian, Spanish, Japanese. These things both exist here. Everyone's interested in both things. So what is the right thing for here? What is the perception here? Uh, so we looked at uh, the courses given in design in Israel, and it's amazing because um, this is just part of them. And we calculated that if the museum was in touch with every course in Israel, it could have a group visiting every, uh, every, day, every of its open days during the year, and they would only have to visit once. Um, so there is an immense uh, interest, and people are studying various... And this questions the, the um, definition of what is the design museum. What is design in terms of the museum? Who should it be addressing? Uh, which design? So we look, the, the central uh, mark is of the design museum Hulon proposal to be involved actually being in a, in a local, in a locality which covers uh, a small immediate group. Uh, it should have an affinity to as many uh, areas as possible in order to include as many of the people that might be interested in it. Um, so it might look that it's smaller, but in fact, for instance, in terms of uh, its interest in art, I think it should be more involved in the relationship of design and art than, for instance, the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this is a tool for defining the activity in the museum, but it's also a tool for five years later thinking, okay, what is our footprint now, and seeing where things evolve. So this is a list of the influencing factors that uh, I noted down in order to uh, uh, translate these, uh, these are sort of conclusions. Um, and and uh, the translation of these ideas into a proposal and then into a, uh, an architectural brief and specification was done together with uh, architect Asa Bruno. Name is re uh, recognizable. So this was the character suggested, in view of where museums are going, and in view of the national character, and in view of um, museums around now, uh, which kind of museum could actually uh, be a significant contribution. So starting from a character, how do you translate that into a uh, type? So the suggestion here is a museum of confluence, in the sense that this, if design is a utopia of improvement, then um, influence and returning influence is the key. And understanding how an object becomes what it is, how it represents the, the culture that produces it, and how it affects the culture that produces it, uh, seems to me the most interesting way of uh, <coughs> discussing design. Um, so the definitions for the design museum would be that it's a contemporary design museum for the general public. That's first of all. And uh, very much, once you have a mission, you have to harness all the tools to uh, uh, promote that work, uh, to, to promote that mission. And I think um, the, the strongest thing that I understand that can be done here is to use the people that are involved in design more than the design at this point. And there is very good, uh, I think a very good uh, case to say that um, the, the more activity is generated and the faster things are done, the more substantial things are going to come out in terms of world influence. Um, the, the, the principle is that design, Israeli design is seen as part of world design, not a separate thing, not a unique thing. It's, um, it's design and design is a new uh, field. Um, so, the, building the core identity and solving the problem of not having a collection became the next uh, issue. And 
in, in relation to the idea of strong curatorial uh, uh, leadership in, in the sense that people are people's activity should be the main thing then uh, collect the collection is seen as something that you cherry pick you pick out of exhibitions and after a while you see who you are and the collection um, reflects the interest of the curatorial activity and so it's an idea of a, a building collection that grows out of out of accumulates out of the uh, exhibitions again these exhibitions are completely um, at this point open to to the lead to the curatorial re leadership so after a while you can see the, the understanding of the cu curator and the management in terms of what is designed um, so I'm gonna jump because I think one of the principle that I was looking at in terms of the utopia of improvement is this uh, sort of advertising technique of before and after. And I think it's a very strong uh, sort of uh, mechanism to understand what design can do. And before, uh, initially the, the project was supposed to be a conversion of a, a library. And so what, one of the ideas was if it was a library before, how can it become a museum after. So what has to happen? What kind of design has to happen before, between the before and the after? So that also is the principle of the collection. So in reverse to a traditional museum approach in which uh, an interpretation of the collection is the main sort of agenda. Here the idea is that the curating creates the collection and that uh, in turn creates the identity of the museum. So this was an attempt to write a mission statement. We looked at 100 mission statements and divided them into eight groups, eight types of museums, those that belong to art uh, institutes, those that belong to encyclopedic, archival, or decorative art, or crafts, or industry. <laughs> and it's quite a, quite a difficult thing to write. So I think um, I started something that, uh, again, will have to be completely rethought and redone again and again until it actually uh, helps curate. This was another tool. Um, this was a sort of breaking down to the parts. And um, if we are interested in influence, then one of the uh, proposals is that there'll, there won't be one hall. There'll be at least three areas that have some relationship between them. And there won't be a permanent exhibition, but there will be permanent themes that discuss what design is. Uh, using the borders of design, and that's that circle that includes these little kiosks of the DIY, technology, craft, art, the borders. Um, this is also a suggestion of how to plan a visit and looking at the audience, different kind of audience, you can really sort of plunk down what the uh, areas and which one first, and um, so that's, again, this is sort of a generic tool that will be adapted to what actually comes out. Uh, in terms of the architectural brief, um, we set the guidelines, key guidelines, and we used a lot of little icons to uh, describe uh, ideas like the circulation or like the idea that uh, to, to enjoy vertical height because of the kinds of objects that might end up there, to maintain a very clear idea that you're presenting such a d diversity of objects from stamps to um, pickers, like agricultural date pickers. Or, um, so that was things that were put into the brief. But in terms of the guidelines, so the, the vibrant landmark presence is a request. Uh, but together with the idea that the infrastructure supports the curating. So there was a very distinct definition and translated into specifications of exactly what could happen in the hall. So the hall is described as a neutral, smart, motherboard kind of thing that actually has, in terms of budget again, as much connectivity, as much modularity, and as much fixability. So if you want to hang a uh, reliance to sit on the ceiling, you can. Um, in terms of the experience, we were, it's located near a recently built uh, media center of library and theater, and the patio there is a very su substantial uh, relationship, and it sh the, the, in the brief it was defined that it should also 
uh, act as an events area and sort of lead uh, into the museum with a very uh, particular sense of entering somewhere, sort of mind-setting event, something that you feel, okay, you're somewhere else. The central circulation, um, which is, came up in a lot of discussions with design directors, such as uh, um, Alexander van Wegezep in uh, Vitra, is talking a lot about the importance of the clarity of getting to places and the ability not to feel that one area is closed and you're missing something. And um, So again, these discussions made their way into principles. And I think I'm going to, uh, how am I doing? Okay. Right. So, just a bit of uh, the people that I talked to and uh, some of the places visited, and um, it was a, a fantastic thing to to discuss the idea of a new design museum without um, a starting point in the sense of uh, it could be any type. And uh, what was very clear at the end of this is that we can't find a type and bring it in and, and adjust it. We have to come up with our own type. And that sort of contradicts the idea in terms of uh, design is a global thing. So what, how come you think you can do your own type better than others? So uh, this is maybe the only point where I, I uh, think the idea of global and local is, use, <coughs> is useful. Um, it's useful in the sense that it's a, it is a global story. But the storyteller is local. And uh, what was very clear at the end of this is that we can't find a type and bring it in and, and adjust it. We have to come up with our own type. And that sort of contradicts the idea in terms of uh, design is a global thing. So what, how come you think you can do your own type better than others? So uh, this is maybe the only point where I, I uh, think the idea of global and local is, use, is useful. Um, it's useful in the sense that it's a, it is a global story, but the storyteller is local. Uh, so a, a summary of the declarations that uh, I hope are useful for the architects, because the vision that started with the client made itself into a list of, a shopping list through the brief and uh, is now in, being translated into the vision of the architect. And from there, um, into the realm of the curators and the visitors. But just to sum up the sort of um, thinking that went behind it, that if we understand the identity, we can write the mission and we understand the type of museum, that will establish the curatorial approach, and from that, the architecture, and again, influence the identity. So, thank you. The three lectures come from very different disciplines. All three will regard water, the liquid of life, um, as either a starting point or a focal point for the lecture. Uh, Moti, Erez, and Alon uh, may not know this, but I must admit that during the conceptualizing stage of the conference, I had some second thoughts about this session. Uh, I thought that we might be stretching <coughs> I thought that we might be stretching the Mediterranean material uh, <clears throat> maybe a bit too thin, changing over to water and desert, which are whole new subjects. Um, I thank Nirit for persisting, <coughs> but even more my thanks to Moti for his research and analysis weave some of the loose ends that I saw into a fascinating carpet. I'm honored to invite Dr. Moti Hyman lecturer at bar University and research archaeologist at the Israeli Antiquities Authority. Uh, the southern periphery of Israel, the Negev, is an arid desert that does not allow for uh, agricultural activity. Despite uh, the natural conditions of the wilderness, a dense agricultural system spans all over the area. Uh, due to the excellent state of preservation, uh, the unique phenomenon of thousands of kilometers of terraced bodies, like the kind we see here, uh, farmhouses and various uh, agricultural installations uh, constitute the dominant element in the present day landscape. Uh, researches conducted in the past uh, have dated the remains of uh, that uh, desert agriculture to the Nabataeans. 
uh, uh, from the 2nd century BC to the 2nd century CE. However, uh, the later studies uh, dated uh, the systems to the 5th to 8th centuries CE. The uh, earlier studies of uh, uh, desert agriculture conducted by Evan Ari and his team during the 1950s and 1960s focused on the uh, relevance of uh, runoff rainwater management in explaining the mechanism of the ancient agricultural features such as terraced bodies uh, and channels for collecting runoff water, both for uh, water systems and for uh, agricultural terraces. Uh, as, uh, and uh, as well as the uh, enigmatic phenomenon of uh, Turelatel Anar. Uh, those are uh, large areas covered with stone heaps, each of one meter in diameter. This is an aerial photograph. There is a close look on that uh, phenomenon. Um, uh, this uh, this uh, enigmatic installation is to uh, increase the efficiency of runoff rainwater to reach the terraced valleys. Evan Ari showed uh, that uh, uh, the runoff rainwater collection systems conduct a, a concentrate water from an area that is five times bigger, uh, larger than the area in which the water actually drains. Thus, the average of 80 millimeter uh, rainfall, which is totally insufficient for grain growth, uh, expand to 400 millimeters, creating uh, conditions like those in the sedentary land. Here we have a uh, real-time demonstration how the ancient systems still collect water uh, uh, near uh, Nitsana. Significant progress uh, in documentation of agricultural systems, including archaeological excavations, uh, was made in the frame of the Negev Emergency Survey conducted from 1979 to 1990. About 50% of the Negev uh, was surveyed. In light of the findings of that survey, um, it appears that the uh, uh, agricultural settlement uh, should be dated to the Byzantine and Umayyad uh, periods to the 5th to the 8th century CE. Notice please the uh, excellent state of preservation and how those systems still design the landscape. <coughs> the conclusions up uh, to 10 years ago were that uh, that settlement in the Negev was a Mediterranean desert peripheral settlement initi initiated and supported by the state began in the Byzantine period and continued to exist even, and even expanded during the uh, Umayyad period. Uh, in the Byzantine, the Byzantine settlement uh, was limited to the northern part of the Negev Desert, uh, including six towns uh, and many farms around them. We see here two of those famous towns in the Negev, there are more. Uh, here is a, an example of uh, a landscape. Uh, this, this is the uh, town of Nitsana in the red. And uh, notice the density, enormous density of agricultural installations in the heart of the wilderness uh, in the rear, at the rear of uh, Nitsana. Some more characteristic of that settlement, uh, arches, uh, farmhouses, and uh, carved lintels. One of the most important components of that uh, agriculture was uh, uh, industri uh, uh, industrialized wine production. The upper left um, slide show a, a big uh, industrial uh, uh, wine press. Uh, line AA marks the uh, Byzantine settlement. North to it there is a, uh, the settled area. South to it uh, is an area which was populated by nomads whose uh, material culture is totally different. The uh, Omeyyad period in the desert uh, represents a certain decline of an unknown degree at, uh, in some of those towns. However, the, there was a sharp rise in the number of agricultural farms in the former Byzantine um, areas as well as uh, south to the periphery. <coughs> the, architecture, uh, uh, the architecture of the Omeyyad uh, farmhouses and the, agricultural, and the agriculture differs from that of the Byzantine in some important components such as uh, the disappearance of, uh, of uh, the wine industry. Here are some uh, phenomena of the uh, uh, early Islamic uh, characteristic. The, the upper right is an, a mosque attached to a church. The other slide shows 
uh, farmhouses. Here too, uh, the farms uh, still today design the uh, desert landscape. These are all uh, early Islamic farms from the Umayyad period, 8th century CE. Installations. Um, the wine press, the big wine press disappeared. However, it was replaced by a small number uh, of small wine uh, press, like the upper left uh, slide, the right uh, upper slide. Uh, is a present-day Bedouin threshing of barley in an ancient early Islamic uh, uh, farm. Line uh, uh, B, B represent the expansion of the extension of the is early Islamic farms into the harsh desert. And uh, below, uh, south to that uh, settled area, the area was uh, populated by nomads. Uh, throughout the 1990s, uh, due to a large-scale intensification of uh, uh, surveys and excavation in the Beersheba Valley, north to the desert, uh, due, uh, uh, it was found that a tremendous number of agricultural farms uh, from the Byzantine and Omeya period of the type that prevails in the Negev Highlands were dispersed throughout the area as well as in other areas to the east and west. The components of that agricultural settlement uh, includes uh, terrace bodies, farmhouses, water systems, and large number of Tulalatel Anar. Uh, until then, those Tulalatel Anar, those enigmatic stone heaps, were believed to be a unique desert phenomenon. The Byzantine uh, city of Beersheba was surrounded by farms whose distribution is about six to eight times as dense as though, uh, that area in the Negev Highlands. It seems that the entire Beersheba vicinity is scattered with, the, uh, with agricultural farms and the city itself included a core of uh, public uh, buildings surrounded by farmhouses whose density increased toward the center. We can see here the uh, city of Beersheba, the Byzantine city, is the ancient Byzantine uh, town. The, that outline around it is the present day Beersheba. Uh, the red triangles represent farmhouses, notice the density and the red dots uh, are uh, uh, water uh, holes. Uh, the components of that agriculture, as mentioned, are ident identical to those uh, of the Negev, uh, not to the terraced bodies, uh, and uh, that enigmatic phenomenon of uh, Turalatel uh, Anar. Uh, the farmhouses are also identical to that of the Negev Highlands, uh, as uh, you can see here in, uh, in uh, those uh, slides. The same situation was revealed in the Byzantine city of uh, Malchata, east of the town of Beersheba. About uh, 60 farms uh, were surveyed, and the periphery of the city can be described as uh, Beersheba uh, as a group of farmhouses that increased uh, in density toward the central area. The agricultural settlement contains the farmhouses located near Wadis, uh, water cisterns, and uh, a field of uh, Turalat al Anab. This is the uh, town of Malfata from the Byzantine period. The bold frame uh, down represents an uh, agricultural unit uh, whose all uh, uh, organs are identical to that of the desert, the extreme desert. Now we move, move uh, further north to the sedentary land in Israel. A major surprise was uh, the recent discovery of similar types of farms in the vicinity of Rosh Ha'ayim, east of Tel Aviv, located in the heart of the sedentary land. The farms are distributed between larger agricultural settlements, typical uh, to the hill area and the Shefela, uh, demonstrating two different strategies of settlement and land use. Uh, one, which is not here, uh, includes villages with agricultural fields on the slope of the hills, surrounded by various installations uh, hewn in the rock, uh, such as wine process, oil process, and burial caves. The other one, this one here, <coughs> is in, located in narrow valleys, uh, those valleys uh, of the type uh, described above, which includes terrace valleys, fences surrounding sections of valleys, farmhouses, and even to the Latel Anar. This is a group of farms uh, south to Rosh Ha'ayim. All the components are the same like in the Negev Desert. This aerial uh, photograph shows the two different strategies of agriculture. Uh, one. Uh, mark uh, the larger areas, flat areas, are the traditional hill, uh, hill uh, agricultural area. And in the narrow valleys, notice that those 
terraces, uh, and this is the agriculture which is similar to that of the Negev Desert. Uh, here too, the, the, little, the small components of that uh, agricultural identical in all the details uh, to the Negev Desert, terraced valleys, farmhouses, and, uh, and uh, walls. Uh, in conclusion, a uniform, type of, a uniform type of agricultural system is uh, scattered along the southern periphery of Israel. Uh, until recently, this type of farms was known only in the, in the arid desert uh, region, and it was believed that this type uh, of settlement was adapted to the desert environment. Surveys uh, carried out over the past decade revealed that these farms are uh, prevalent in various ecological niches, <coughs> arid, semi-arid, as well as the sedentary land without significant differences. It seems that the main factor shared in common by sites of this type is not uh, only their uh, natural environment, uh, but, ra uh, but uh, rather their location in the periphery of the, uh, of the state. In my opinion, this type of peripheral farming marks a general trend of the state, both in Byzantine and Omaya period, toward filling the area with agricultural farms due to considerations of desert policy. In the South Levant alone, uh, this remains, remains cover in er the area of the Shefela and the Negev uh, in Israel, part of the Palestinian Authority near Gaza, and uh, some part of northeastern Sinai, uh, probably up to El Arish, totaling about seven, maybe 10,000 square kilometers. The uh, ag uh, ag agricultural settlement of the de Negev des of the desert frontier in the South Levant is not a sole phenomenon of this kind. A desert frontier agriculture settlement, agricultural settlement of, the, uh, of a tremendous scale is known in Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria from the Roman and Byzantine period uh, antedate the South Levant settlement. I mentioned here a large scale uh, field work carried out by uh, Parker and Mattingly and uh, others published in 1996, estimating uh, the agricultural uh, systems in Tripolitania alone in 75,000 square kilometers. Uh, the, that slide represents some of the farms in uh, Tripolitania. And please notice the similarity in uh, the system of terracing uh, bodies and using them. Uh, speaking in terms of this conference, Mediterranean uh, design, it is obvious that uh, the ancient Mediterranean states, uh, Roman, the Byzantines, and the Omayyads, uh, loved the desert periphery of the, uh, of the Mediterranean. For hundreds of years, uh, the desert frontier was designed, designed by those states uh, through an enormous effort to create uh, artificial fields in the, in the wilderness, uh, developing sophisticated systems to collect every drop of water uh, in order to support a uh, large-scale population in some uh, areas uh, even larger than today. Thanks. It was the same as today. I mean, there is a big argument until now uh, between scholars who prefer the uh, climate explanation and others like me who show that uh, the collecting system of water, design. the design is intent to collect uh, water, uh, very low uh, rate, rate of water. One of the scholars, some scholars said that if this systems would build in a rainy area, it, they would be destroyed. I mean, this is a desert system of uh, water quality. I'd like to thank Ido and uh, Nirit, of course, and Yael and Beverly. It's a very professional and very pleasant, yet very pleasant uh, conference. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not
uh, picture was taken at the, the, 18th, the 19th century by a British traveler called Palmer. Uh, it is uh, in the Nitsana, in the Negev area, uh, where the Nabakians, the Byzantians maybe, now I know, <laughs> uh, dwelt, lived, and uh, that's the uh, place uh, where they use, they try to use uh, uh, every drip of water uh, in order to live, survive, and cultivate uh, and grow for their own uh, their own food. But that's uh, about the last uh, thing I'm going to speak about it. Uh, but I leave it on for a while. Um, the connection I can make between the Nabataeans or the Byzantine or the people who dwelt in the desert area is uh, their uh, efficient use in water. And the way they try to use it very, very efficient to collect every drip, uh, drop of water and uh, to make a precise product, if you can call a system that can spread on tens or uh, maybe less than ten, but few kilometers to uh, uh, conserve water, but should be very precise and take it to one place and to preserve it and then to uh, use it very uh, efficiently. Now I'll go to my own uh, archaeology. Uh, these are some uh, presentation I made while I was still an uh, uh, employee, employee in a design studio in Tel Aviv. It's more than 15 or 16 years ago. It's for Netafim. And uh, these are uh, sprinklers uh, for Netafim. And uh, I tried to, uh, when I first uh, signed to design for Netafim, I thought, they are dealing with water, and uh, all the products that, uh, uh, most of the products that I saw that uh, you, uh, were for uh, irrigation, uh, apart from the tubes, were, were, were designed very roughly, very, very rough and robust and uh, not round. And I, the first thing almost I thought was uh, that the aesthetic fit, I would like it to be uh, as the uh, Water comes on stones and makes it round, or uh, on the <coughs> earth sometimes, and it changes the uh, object it, uh, touches and makes it more round. So I tried to make it uh, round on the corners as much as they, as they let me in at the film, because they have a lot of other uh, consideration to do. So this is, these are the first presentations. They all have the funny names, like you see here. Uh, it has to do with uh, the shape, the look, or what, or what uh, I thought is connected to water sometimes. So this is a hat trick, and that's a lollipop, and that's a, a tonicate, it's a, with a triangular, so it's a... And of course, in Netafins, they have a global uh, committee for uh, names, which I'm not a uh, part of it. I <laughs> and uh, oh, it's good for them, I think. And they gave it name like Supernet, Micronet, and it's always net for net of film, it's net for it's a net of products, and uh, I try to make it a net of product uh, the way they look. Uh, so these are all prehistory, it's done by, uh, I think, two-dimensional uh, software in computer. There wasn't any uh, three-dimensional uh, software then at that time, or it was just the beginning. Um, it's the stakes and the sprinklers. Uh, for the uh, sprinkler department of uh, Netafim. These are some, several uh, stakes you see here. It all has to be, um, it's all, all calculated in, in, in the industry like in Netafim because, um, the, uh, of course, the water, uh, the hydrological uh, engineering of, of the product is very, very precise. Uh, and the quantity of plastic, because it's produced by uh, tens of thousands or millions of thousands <coughs> of products, it has to be on the uh, one gram or two grams uh, of plastic is very uh, important. And so uh, 
in this uh, strict uh, demands, I try to uh, yet make the design uh, ergonomically ergonomically good, which means uh, also uh, sometimes also the aesthetics. I consider it to be ergonomically good if the aesthetic is good, because it uh, creates an identity which the uh, user can this product with the, which the user can identify with and uh, also the way it works and sometimes the way it works uh, is more important than to have uh, one or two grams of plastics and in the tough they understand it sometimes not all the time um, this is uh, uh, one of the first products it's, uh, I think it's called the Supernet Gyronet, yeah I mean, they, it's, they all look quite the same, so I, I'll ask the designer. <laughs> uh, it's uh, with the stakes, uh, one of the stakes that uh, was presented before, which was uh, chosen and developed, and there are several uh, versions of the same things. Uh, this is a different one, uh, but it's the same uh, for the same uh, department. It's an uh, anti-drainage uh, valve, in fact. It's very small. They're all very, very small. Uh, the uh, competition of this valve was very uh, <coughs> robust looking, uh, anonym, anonymous looking uh, objects, and I tried to make it more, first of all, round, as you see, uh, and then uh, tried to make it a little bit more aesthetical and high tech look. Maybe, I don't know what that word uh, sometimes means, but. Uh, Netafim is uh, really uh, the high-tech of the irrigation uh, uh, world, I would say. And uh, they uh, try to uh, behave like a high-tech company, in fact. And this is the same uh, uh, anti-drainage valve with, uh, with uh, one of the UD, it's called Upside Down. It's a short for Upside Down a Sprinkler which hangs in the greenhouses. Uh, at the first, uh, when I worked for Netafim, I asked them why don't they use uh, colors, only black colors, as you've seen before, some black uh, sprinklers. And they said, no, it's not, it won't, wouldn't stand uh, the climate and the sun, it will change the, uh, the, the colors doesn't like uh, a harsh climate and uh, strong sun. And, uh, and the, after a few years, uh, this not from it didn't came from me. I just uh, made uh, colors in the presentations, <laughs> but uh, I came once to the Department of uh, Research and Development, and I see it's all full of colors. So uh, it took them some years, but now I can see the presentations are matching the product. So. So this is the upside down. This is the, one of the presentations. See, I did uh, use some color, but and now they do have it, and that's the real product. This is a presentation, of course, and that's a real, a real product. And uh, I'm happy that they are using uh, colors. First of all, it looks nice, and then uh, I think also uh, uh, makes uh, makes the user. Uh, the user can identify more with something that is more colorful and lively, maybe. It's not so anonymous. You have to remember these are very, very small products. It's almost the tip of the finger of the <coughs> size of them. Uh, this is, these are also presentations for, as you see, the names, I give you some name, uh, global names. It's a cup. <laughs> Capriccio, Cascado, it has to do sometimes with the uh, looks, sometimes with the uh, water, sometimes <coughs> with just what has my mind, my mind. I think Cascado in Italian is, uh, has to do with water. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe being... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is, uh, in fact, the competition. Uh, there was some, you see the hanger on the top of it. Before I came to Netafim and they gave me some product of competitor, competitors, uh, there was just uh, 
it's to hang this, by the way, it's to hang this plant roots in the greenhouse. They hang it on a string over the, the trays of the plants, and it's a sprinkler from, the, uh, from above the trays, and uh, when you have to take it down, you have to take it down or to break it. You have to take down all the other ones that are on the, uh, hanged on the string. And uh, it was really, uh, it fascinated me why they didn't think of making a hanger. <laughs> so, and uh, I made this hanger, it was uh, well accepted, and of course the competitors uh, uh, copied it and uh, improved it, in fact. They made it a uh, sort of a, a spring uh, hanger. This is quite a new uh, competition for it. And they did do use some colors there, I see, a little bit. This you already saw in areas, uh, there are all several uh, different types of uh, sprinklers. Sometimes I, uh, I'm afraid I'm uh, too, uh, I'm too uh, adventurous, maybe, for uh, Netafim, which is quite a conservative firm, uh, company, but uh, because uh, when I look at it, it says like a Lego, it's, it's uh, the users, which are uh, farmers, they want to, to see maybe the justice of a, a, a high product that can stand a rough climate in the product. And sometimes things, they do look sometimes like children toys, like Lego. And nevertheless, they, uh, Lego they is set... Yeah, it is. Yeah, but it's still a toy. So, and uh, nevertheless, it, did, it does sell a lot, so maybe they... That's a... The same one, but it's also it has to do with ergonomic. It's very simple to uh, dismantle it and to put it back together. Very few. It's not only me, of course, or almost not only me. Or not me. It's because the uh, very very good engineering uh, department in uh, Netafim, the R and D, as Eric said, held by Yair Shomer, uh, very innovative and uh, very open. This is also a competition, just I don't, I think it's a new one, very new one. Yes, Eris is, yes. Uh, as I told you, most of the sprinklers or the water uh, products world, until a few years ago, uh, was a very robust, uh, square looking uh, product. And uh, I think I've changed a little, it a little bit because uh, Netafim is a global company, in fact, maybe a leader in its uh, field. And this is done by another leader, it's filled also Israeli. The competition is uh, inner Israeli competition here. So uh, as I think copied me, it's quite a compliment for me, I think. Not bad. <laughs> this is Yair Shomer, by the way. That's the head of the uh, R&D department uh, in Netafim. He's holding, it's not a World Cup, it's a sprinkler painted in gold, which they gave him after they sold uh, one million, I think. 10 million, yeah. 10 million products like that. Uh, it's, it's written as I think he got the 10 million and two. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, I think I have some numbers here. Anyway, they sell in 10 million, 10 million, 5 million, uh, all kinds of, the, of the products. So they do have to consider the amount of plastic they put in water uh, you, uh, you put inside the ground because it gives order to the computer when the ground is uh, dry. And uh, you can see the tip of it is just the quantities of water, of course. The big green one is a closer look at it. This is a, another product by the same company. Um, it's a spray gun, I would say, for uh, water holes. And uh, <coughs> when I assigned to this uh, design, they, uh, they only exist uh, spray guns which look like guns. And uh, we thought it's, um, it's ha it has nothing to do with this area, but as, until today, I think, you, you, uh, m most of them look like uh, revolvers or uh, things like that. And uh, we thought, First of all, uh, wo uh, also wo uh, women use them, and not men, and they buy them in the market. And it looks very masculine, usually, and uh, 
we tried to make it more that. The main reason it looks like that is because, I, I thought, uh, about the idea of uh, holding the water and aiming it while you use it. In fact, of course, I, by uh, surprise, I'm happy. <laughs> It's really a collector's item because the company doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but the, whole, the uh, idea is to hold the water inside as much as because you don't feel them. And in fact, it's an extension of the of the pipe. And the, it's, you don't push, press it here. You have a, also some of the knot here. So uh, and you can adjust the spray. And here you adjust the strength of the. <coughs> That's a spray, uh, sprayer, the, the other one there. And you see it in use here, and here. That's another product of the same company. I love the products of these companies that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, in fact, it's a sort of bucket to uh, um, water the, the flower pots or the pots in your house when you're away in a vacation or I don't know. It uh, contains water in it, and uh, the pipes you see goes to uh, the pots, and you, uh, you put it near the pots, and then uh, it has batteries in it, and it uh, gives water to the pots uh, for two weeks. And uh, by dripping the other systems, it's not a revolutionary, revolutionary item. Uh, Peugeot, I think, had one, and some other company, Italian and French company had, but they looked all like a. a the water tanks and square water tanks, and I thought it's not really a inside house uh, product. So I, we decided of making it like more, more uh, like a bucket. And anyway, since this uh, company doesn't exist, we might use it now as a you no know, bucket in the house. So uh, you see it here, and when you want to uh, to fill water in it, you use the, the handle there. You see, and you can. Just open it and then it's open and you can put water in it and take it to the sink and fill it with water. This is not uh, the same, but I'll go to the next one. Uh, this also has to do with water. It's a um, self-watering system. Uh, sort of a big pot with... As a pot. There's a pump inside the water down there, in the uh, base of it. And you pour water in it, and you put a uh, uh, fertilizer tablet there. And for oh, also about two weeks, it, it, uh, the pump, it pumps the water up a small pipe to the top of it, and then it goes down back through the uh, small holes. Uh, they signed me for this project when this came back from Japan. Uh, I didn't know about it, but then they showed it to me, and they gave me a reject uh, list about 120 or 130 rejects of uh, clients in Japan, which uh, they didn't want to buy it anymore. And then uh, I planned this one, it's a smaller one, and uh, there's, there isn't any water pipe. In fact, it's, it's very simple. The pots, the pipe is inside the pot, it's part of the pot, in fact. And all the three pots are the same, with a very large pipe inside, inside them, which also connects the uh, pots and uh, you fill it from this uh, hole down there. It goes up and through there, and you, the Japanese don't see the rust mark that the water leaves in the other one. They saw it because there was a, uh, uh, I said to show it. No. There is a margin between each pot, and the water left uh, rust uh, signs on the, on the outside of the pillar. And that was one of the 130 rejects <laughs> the Japanese, of course. Uh, enough with the water market, a little bit. Uh, this is a, a company that makes uh, uh, machines for the packaging industry. Uh, it's not the name of the company, that's the name of a product. This, uh, they came to me with this product. It's um, a product that has, takes a roll of, uh, of plastic and uh, you put it in and it uh, makes uh, bags 
and fills it with air. And then you put the bags in the space between the products and the car in the uh, car box, in the carton box. It's a very, very growing industry in the world. All the packaging industry is uh, booming in the world, be uh, especially because of the internet. Uh, Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble and everybody is selling via the internet now all kind of products, not only books. So I. That's a, that's a product I made from them few, <laughs> several years ago. And Polio is the name of an American company. It's, uh, I think, the third, the second or the third biggest uh, packaging company company in, uh, in the North America. <coughs> I had uh, the honor of working on this uh, machine with a, a genius engineer, Israeli one, and um, he really revolutionized the way this uh, machine work. The, the product you've seen before it really is a British one. It still sells a little bit, but uh, this one, first of all, it's more than half the price of, uh, uh, less than half the price of the one you saw before, but it's uh, ergonomically uh, designed to, uh, well, it's, it's better ergonomically designed and aesthetically, I suppose. Uh, you see the roll of film. You open the you open the lid uh, from the side. All the work is done from the side. Also, you don't have to lift uh, the roll of the uh, polyethylene, and to put it in place, I just make it to push it from the side because sometimes they stand high. These uh, machines. This is what they do. It is uh, put it uh, around. This is where it works. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in America. Uh, it goes to a big bag. Over there you see the, the blue one. And people take it from the other side, you see here, to the conveyor down there where the packages go. That's a competition. <laughs> After two years, about uh, two, it's about four or five years on the market, this one. It uh, sells very well, and so there's a competition. This is uh, not an Israeli competition, it's an American competition. <laughs> But uh, I don't think they got really the idea because uh, it's very heavy to put the roll, the plastic roll on it. And, they, <coughs> and you still have to put it from the top here. And I made it put on the side so I have something to tell them about it. <laughs> that's another, the one that's there before what is called the airspace, which is a very nice main, name, also by international committee or something. And uh, this one is called the kangaroo, the next machine. The logo, I made the logos by the way, but I don't know it's, but because this one was made because it's uh, packaging and I thought kangaroo, when uh, the uh, female kangaroo puts a child in the, you know, in the pocket, it's sort of a package. Uh, so I thought yeah, it has to do with, uh, this is a machine that it uh, succeeds, it's not the, com the same company, it's just a machine by other <coughs> company. I just uh, bring it to see what, it's a very huge machine it, to, to cut and to make, uh, it's, it has two functions, to cut a uh, bubble uh, uh, rock, uh, plastics, bubble sheets of plastics, also for the packaging industry, and to make envelopes, uh, padded envelopes. Also, it's a very, very big thing now to put uh, everything in uh, CDs and uh, printed circuits and everything in, in, in padded envelopes. And this is the machine that I designed. It's a small one. It's also, I worked with this genius engineer, whose name is Hasby, by the way. And uh, it changed the whole uh, directions of the things here. So it made it, made it very compact and uh, much cheaper, of course, and uh, very, very uh, efficient and ergonomically, uh, considering the other uh, things that were in this market before. This is a project that didn't come to life, and it's called, it's a, for a company called Bypass, B-U-Y-P-A-S-S, buy for buying things, and uh, it's a company that had, had an idea of uh, making the shopping in the supermarkets, in places like that, to make it uh, without uh, uh, going to the cash, to the cashiers. 
because then you have to stand in the queue. You buy for 20 minutes or half an hour, then you have to stand 10 minutes, half an hour, 20 minutes, and wait for your turn to pay. And uh, this is one of the first uh, prototypes. Uh, it has a computer in it. It's a sort of a cradle between the handle and the scanner, which I tried to get rid of, but they wouldn't let me, and they couldn't make it smaller. That's the r orange one in the front. And that's one of the problems that uh, this, uh, that's one of the problems that this uh, product has, that it uh, didn't uh, develop to a, to be a very a small one. It's quite a big one with a big scanner. They, you scan the product, and then it uh, has a it has a special uh, barcode with a, another object inside the barcode, which uh, the scanner neutralizes. And when you put it inside the ca uh, cart, and then it tells you, of course, the price of it, and it uh, tells the total sum of the what you bought. That's the size of, of it. There also there's also a, a sort of a I thought the customer would like to have, if it doesn't go to the cash, he doesn't, doesn't uh, have to go looking for uh, uh, plastic bags. So I made a sort of a plastic bag cartridge. Down there you see the yellow thing there, inside the cartridge. That's some of the plastic. This is from the pilot. It was totally changed in the pilot uh, we made, made in, uh, in a supermarket for several months because uh, the carts came from uh, South Africa and they were totally different. So I had to change uh, a lot of the... These are standing and a customer comes, take a cart, go inside the supermarket, puts in the cradle a sort of a computer and a scanner. This is the, the stand where he, take, he put his uh, card, credit card there, and uh, it says uh, it takes a, 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 a computer with a scanner, uh, and that's the last version of the of the computer and scanner before this company was going to the same packages that I told you before. It was then, uh, just two years ago, as uh, well, we say, the bubble blew, and this high-tech company went inside and still in the packages. This is uh, another, it's, it's for the same company. This is a, a, a product that the manager has that he can uh, control the products that were uh, neutralized and he can check them. Uh, and he just put it in his pocket and he goes around. This is the new version of it. That's the screen that the customer sees. It's a, a flat screen, it's, there's no buttons, it's just graphics, you know. It's a, so, and it's very simple, you just put a, a product in, fact, in front of the scanners, uh, you put the buy, and when you return it, you genius less. Okay. I have to finish, <laughs> but uh, I have a special, uh, okay, that's a product I made uh, three or four years ago, it's uh, for a company called uh, Scope Shield. it's an American doctor who thought that uh, when a doctor checks you uh, with a stethoscope and uh, then comes another patient and checks him, he has to clean the stethoscope, it's a funny product in fact. And uh, usually they don't clean it. I'm sure. Uh, well, in Israel, and, and, but in, in, in America, so I'm sure in America they don't clean it. <laughs> he doesn't clean it. So he thought of making uh, stickers to put on the stethoscope between each patient when they pay. So uh, he made a sort of a small uh, uh, box of, of, of carton, a carton box, uh, with an accordion sticker that the doctor had to open and take. Uh, with his hand, and he, they didn't use it. It was very difficult. So he came to me and they asked me to design it. And I thought, uh, first of all, uh, about children, because children usually, my children at least, didn't like to go to the doctor. And the doctor usually, before the, she didn't uh, start to uh, check them, she gave them a candy. Uh, and I thought, well, we might give them a sticker instead of candy. So uh, that they sold uh, this project, but with uh, stickers and all kinds of stickers, and uh, of course it's also a sort of a promotion for some the augmenting or whatever. <coughs> and this is 
excavation of Netafim products in the year 4004, uh, just to be connected to the, sub to the <laughs> subject of the conference here. And uh, I was wondering about local and global design and all this stuff. And of course, Netafim has uh, our market in Israel, immediate market, almost doesn't exist for a company like Netafim and competitors, Israeli competitor, who are uh, really a global player in this uh, uh, field. And the immediate market, uh, because of political situation uh, and some other reasons, uh, almost a cultural reason maybe, doesn't, uh, almost doesn't exist. It didn't exist at all, but in the last years, uh, there are uh, some uh, neighbors that are buying things from Netafim, I suppose, and other companies. And uh, Netafim is a global, uh, and I thought, when, you, when I uh, uh, plan things for uh, a design thing for Netafim, of course I think if they should succeed in the immediate market is the European, the Australian, the American market. And uh, as someone said, uh, uh, the, I think Daniel said, it's, uh, it's a global design today. It's not, uh, design is a global matter, it's not uh, a local in some aspect at least. Uh, but uh, I was uh, thinking that uh, because uh, water is such an important, has a such an important role in, in uh, desert areas, in the Mediterranean, uh, some uh, areas of design deal with like water, like uh, in maybe medical products also, uh, especially water, uh, will at the end will bear some uh, local pattern in it, I don't know when, uh, and uh, like maybe uh, when you say a Swiss watch or a German car or a, an Afri a South African barbecue or an American barbecue, uh, then it Im immediately you connect it to a culture that uses it or the culture that produces it. So maybe the connection is the culture that produces the object. Uh, and I just wondered if 2,000 years from now we'll say, ah, that's a typical Mediterranean uh, product to deal with water. So that's it. Professor Eduardo Porte Real comes from the Escola Superior de Design. This is not the right Portuguese accent, but I have to work on it. Uh, it belongs no. to the Yade in Portugal. And I will say very little about Eduardo because I think his special flair, style, and depth speak for themselves. Um, the short off conference discussions that we've had over the last few days have already proved that Eduardo was an exceptionally good investment. Eduardo, please. This is terrible. Okay, starting like this. Um, being a speaker, a speaker after someone called Ivan Paz. Paz in Portuguese means peace. So I'll start by saying shalom. Uh, I want to thank to Guido. Um, not for inviting me, but uh, for our conversations on the last few days. I'd like to invite, uh, I'd like to also thank um, Nirith. Uh, I, I, Nirith and Tal, and wish them good luck for the sun of water and the flower. No? <laughs> She's so evidently. You tell me. Uh, I'm from outside. <laughs> We're from the, Let's have a big party today. Okay. I wish to thank Beverly, I wish to thank Yale, I, I wish to thank everybody, I wish to thank um, all my colleagues. If you see them getting in the Dead Sea, uh, you would be so, so sympathetic to them. <laughs> going down that stairs and coming up. Well, I'd like Jonathan to please help me here and start this. Uh, well, I start to quote Daniel. 
Cheney. The story is global, but storyteller is is local. So I came from a special localization, with, which is just around the corner. I thank the Mediterranean, the the warm waters in the southern Portugal that came with um, with a wind called Levante brings warm waters to to our shores in the south. Well, this I use Figo because he's he's a known footballer. Uh, obviously, he's almost global. Not in some parts of the world that still resists to. European football, <laughs> but Figo looks like Mediterranean. In fact, he could have been born in any country in the Mediterranean. So he's doing very well. He became a global brand. He performs his profession, which is scoring goals and making good passes. He makes his employer happy, Real Madrid. He makes his his country proud, he could be almost be Turkish. <laughs> so let's use him as a metaphor. Uh, I know I happen to know that Vani will speak about the future the future, so I'll speak about the past and the deep past. So sort of uh, separate things. I'm not getting on his uh, Let's start with the Roman Empire. <coughs> uh, the Roman Empire was, as Alisa said yesterday, the only political structure that unified the Mediterranean. And I think the Mediterranean, uh, I think my argument, my final argument, and I just started to present it to you, is that um, we are facing so much difficulties in defining uh, uh, Mediterranean design because design was a Mediterranean idea and that became global. So we are in a sort of paradox. I, I choose three myths from the Mediterranean that that are uh, fundamental for the creation of the idea of project design, etc. First was the, is the myth of the birth of Venus or Aphrodite. Uh, as you know, uh, the sky, Uranus, every night covered the earth. And Gaia, the earth, concealed one son that would become overthrown his father. His son was um, Cronos, the time. So, a little someday, Cronos came and cut his father's testicles, or a little way to look to die and the semen came on the Mediterranean waters. This is very important because attraction, the laws of attraction, start to exist on the world the moment that the empire of time start to exist. But they are prior from the empire of men on earth. It's a feminine force that uh, drives the, the world along with time. Obviously, Cronus had the nasty habit of eating his sons, which he still does, and eventually Gaia snatched another children that was used, that killed his father and started the empire of men in Earth. This will be important um, a bit, bit later. Another one is the myth of the origin of painting by Plinius. You know the story? A young girl that would be separated from her lover occupies her nest last night with him by painting his shadow on the wall. You would think of better things to do, but she chooses to paint the image, uh, the more likeness possible on the wall. So it's an image that stays present, that helps the longing and I'm, at this point, I must tell you that um, we have a name for a particular kind of longing, which is so bad, and I'm being relocated again in Portugal. That obviously is a, 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 
a word that is structural for all Portuguese language persons. And we tend to think that it, there is no other language with such word. So that is what's, what I experienced by seeing my young daughters printed the first time I saw them, the book of the abstracts. But it's not a sad sentiment. It's, it's, I'm glad to like her, to like them. It's, it's, not a, it's not nostalgia, but it's nostalgia. It's not longing, but it's longing. So it's a difficult, and I think this is very Mediterranean in a certain scale because we started very early, you started very early with naval uh, voyages between very near shores. The other myth, and I will join a fourth myth just for the presentation of Silva. Uh, the third myth is the origin of geometry by Herodotus. You know the story, there were some priests in Egypt that would calculate the dimensions and the borders of the proprieties. So when the Nile flooded all the territory, they kept on their mind the dimensions of all the propri proprieties on that area. So they could reconstruct the, the world after the flood. So this deals, it all deals with, uh, I think, with imagination, active imagination. Um, I will join the fourth. It was a suggestion by Ido, so it's, it's the myth of um, Apollo and Daphne. A Daphne, Daphne is going away from Apollo, and, and when he, he grabs her, he, he, she becomes a tree. So because you said that you, you are you refused a Paulinian and uh, uh, Platonic forms and seeing your drawings and some of the works, I think you can still be running a little bit Apollo, but you will be a tree probably. Or you prefer to be a tree than to be read by Apollo. Okay. Back to the Roman Empire. You, this is the Roman Empire. I'd like to have uh, those things that... Is this... Laser. <laughs> I will burn Germany. Sorry, Matteo. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, that the empire became bigger in the time of Adrian. But this is the time, the empire in the time of August, so the first emperor. I must tell you that uh, being emperor was uh, the utmost of a de democratic state. We always think of emperor as a dynastic su suggest, uh, succession. But basically, uh, the number of voters became, became very thin. In, in fact, at the end, it w were just the Praetorian guards that elected the emperor. Uh, and finally, they started to elect morons, so they could replace it. So there's, there's a story to be think about, about the utmost of the democracy. Uh, so it results from the republic. This, result, this is an, an important idea and define um, <coughs> lots of traces that I think that are still present in this region. Well. Besides the traces that I'll speak about, it created the idea of empire that was repeatedly occurring on these areas. Um, the empires eventually divide in West and Oriental, Byzantine Empire. Uh, I could speak of the Ottoman that occupied the same borders. At least I'm looking at you because the question of borders is important because things tend to adjust to the same positions. Uh, the Russian Empire, uh, the Sacro uh, Roman Germanic Empire, all those empires were defined by the idea of empire. So, what are the traces? What for me are the most important traces? Law and roads. Uh, uh, yesterday, Ellen spoke about global, uh, global um, design. And what would be with Toyota without the Roman roads? It fits clearly. It has the same, the same width of a, a Roman cart. What would be of Ikea without um, 
the Archimedes screw. What would be of Coca-Cola without this nasty habit of drinking brown liquids that we have? <laughs> Law defined property and more than property defined the, the form of transmission of property. Define limits, not limits for tribes, but limits for individuals, families. And they were transmitted by the power of the father. So you will see that Figo is also a metaphor of something Mediterranean. It's the power of the father. This is not a good thing. You, oh, you all know that testosterone, in, a, in effect, in a certain way, uh, men substitute like Zeus, Zeus, this, uh, becoming the, um, the ruler of earth. We all know that testosterone is a forbidden, uh, forbidden drug. You see in the Olympics, so you wouldn't give to a bunch of guys high in testosterone uh, the rule of the world. But apparently, Mediterraneans did. <laughs> this provoked sort of invisibility of, of the woman. This is a characteristic. You might say that now women are visible, but how, how many rectors women are in, in the Mediterranean? How many presidents? You had a prime minister, we had also a prime minister. It was just about it. <laughs> The invisibility, my, 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 it's a sort of volunteer act of invisibility. And you must think of a lot of resonance of this metaphor. The, the, the empire, beside roads, which was a link of communication beside the, the water, nearby communication, was also a form of domination. Romans bring also the right of colonization, the right of conquest. conquest. Uh, the East was mostly conquered from Greece because there were ancient uh, structures, power structures, and the West was mostly colonized. By the way, they spent 200 years trying to conquer Iberia. And six weeks conquering Gallia. <laughs> so, let's uh, <coughs> think a little bit of our bipolar country. Um, we are not uh, really Mediterranean, you know, Mediterranean starts here. Uh, these borders, if you remind the other map, are very similar to the borders of the three Roman provinces. And we have this region here that is mostly what you could see in a landscape as Mediterranean. It looks like Corsica. The fact is that this tuary here, which is Tubal, is very near to these mountains here, which are near Lisbon. You can jump from 40 degrees here to 20 degrees Celsius in summer here. So it's, it's like the meet, meeting point of two uh, kind of notions, the notion of Atlantic and the notion of, of Mediterranean. There's another thing that is important for us, is that Lisbon has a really good harbor so all communications between the Mediterranean and the north of Europe via sea would stop at Lisbon. This, this uh, space here... Uh, <coughs> no? <laughs> Laser. Have been kept really uniform f during invasions. You had... Um, Phoenicians, you had Greeks, you had Romans, you had Visigoths, you have... Stop it. <laughs> Arabs, 
Mosals. Mosals are the more, most interesting because it were the Christians that remained Christians and the, the Arab rule. Jews, Christians, etc. Et but they, at the bottom line, they became all atheists because they were so confused. <laughs> Mostly they go to church, but they are atheists. A little bit like in Sicily. <laughs> so, but the structure of the property is really Roman. Large, large proprieties. People very poor, people very rich, uh, passing their proprieties from uh, son to from father to son. Uh, I like to call Portuguese the people of the Straits. Um, we started them, um, what we call the expansion, the European expansion, yeah, and I think it's, it was more like a Mediterranean idea. Also. Of course, we had some relations <coughs> with England, some marital relations with England, our kings, some special relations with England, but it was not England idea, and I expect to prove this. Okay. The expansion of Mediterranean is also the expansion of uh, the idea of empire, the, the idea of commerce, the idea of colonization. Uh, as you know, Portugal is a very tiny country. At the time that the expansion started, it was about 3 million inhabitants. It was not a very rich country. Um, the money came on the first stage from the order of the temple that became, when the King of France decided to extinguish the order of the temple, um, the, the, the Portuguese king, you know, there are four ways to do things. The good one, the good way, the bad way, the way that the devil would even think about it in the Portuguese way. So, <laughs> the, king, the king decided to, okay, let's change names, you will become the order of Christ. But the, man, the money stayed there, so it was a, a great... Um, and as you know, the order of temple was a sort of migration of forms, symbologies, ideas of the Orient into the, 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 the West. The other f all started here in Ceuta. Uh, the Portuguese conquered much more cities around Ceuta, but the map is too small, and... Uh, and um, how do you say it? The Atlas is French, so it's always a little bit less than, than we, everybody did. So, Ceuta and another city. The conquer of Ceuta was, uh, stereographically, was uh, suggested to King John by a, a rich mer Jew merchant. Uh, I think the idea of um, trading on pepper, <laughs> trading on spices, was something that the Jews were very good at. They have been trading on spices since ever, from the roots, the, the, the land roots of spices from India to, to Europe. This is crazy. It's a, a people that sets lots of caravels on, on the sea just for food, just for spicing food. It's incredible. So, Silta was conquered. So the Ceuta, Ceuta and more Tangier, <laughs> Alcácer, Seguir, other, other cities were, so the, um, the Strait of Gibraltar was controlled. So every flow out of the Mediterranean was, was uh, controlled. The same happened a century later with the Adam Gulf, uh, with this fortress in Socotra, Ormuz, and finally Malacca here. So all the navigation out in the world was controlled by Portuguese in, 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 in this sense. Uh, it had a secondary effect. It strangled the Mediterranean. So the, Mediter the Mediterranean started to collapse. Some of the great civilizations like Venice, it's at, at this time that the uh, theoricians like Alviso Cornar or Gian Giorgio Tristino build the idea of terra firma, start looking at our land because we don't have as much trade as we have. So, but this is 
Another secondary effect, effect was the expansion of the northern countries, the Russians eastward and the British westward. So, and the, the British and um, remember that um, utopia from Thomas More, who tells the story about the island is a Portuguese, tired Portuguese sailor. Because in London he tells the story that he went to a, to a place that he, he described. So the British and the Russian, you can say that what they propagate was their own culture. Their own culture was not preparing, prepared to the idea of empires. So they imported like like important uh, architectural forms that were forms from the Mediterranean, uh, classical forms, Neo-Palladianism, the, 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 architecture, the architectural language of the, of the British Empire is something that came from the Mediterranean. So, let's move on. We came to Tolentej, the region. As you see, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly something that looks like in the training, like Figo. It's something that is, it's a place, it's a place for longing, for long periods of siesta, long periods of contemplating. And from now on, I will start to read my, my abstract. Those who have read it, maybe with my accent, will be more funny. <laughs> Okay, I will speak about, about um, a sort of pre-designed stuff, a sort of primeval object, sort of something that can enlighten us about the, the origins and the, the main things about design. So I, I separate this in three sections. The one I, the first I call the nature of design and design by nature. Well. And it, it is funny, but by accident, I, twist, uh, I switch threes with trees, but it became more, even more interesting because nor trees are interested in threes, nor threes are interested in trees. And tripods in nature are very rare. So threes are growing according, not according to natural rules. Larger branches originate thinner branches this growing formula can, by accident, provide a particular structural situation. Form is determinant here. Um, form is determinant here, since almost all conjectures are not suitable to build a stool. This is a stool. Threes are not designing stools, and most of stools are built by reducing a tree to a raw material, wood, and then be assembled. We saw lots of stools here, so, like this. Endlessly generating branches, trees do the assembling part. The cunning guys of humans do the rest. Here lies the nature of design. Driven by necessity, humans can draw a form, isolating a part from a larger formal, formal context. This is only possible due to the ability to, to contemplate. Allow me to state that contemplation is a Mediterranean characteristic. And I will add something more, active contemplation. Active, active contemplation that has become drawing, for instance. So it's not passive contemplation, it's contemplation to do things, to have the three myths together. Geometry, call it love, uh, or attraction, and uh, representation. So, it's due to the form of time of these shores and land. Time has an incredible depthness. Cultures leave their traces like layers. On the other hand, they had the heat and the slow rhythms of our agriculture modulated human traditions. The feeling of the sea nearby also promoted the longing required for contemplation. The stool that we are speaking about feels like very primitive, but achieves a large, large amount of contemporary design goals not existing two quite alike, it stands for a model and not for an object. Each tool is different and can be customized to the user. It can be recycled as firewood. This 
three dimensions of design or three dimensions of design can characterize a Mediterranean approach. Produce models and not objects, customize the use, think of nature. Okay. Did it switch? Yes. I can do something very fine. No. No, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is another guy. Okay. Thinking about the Mediterranean region and not thinking about religion is a cowardly proposition. If we try to produce pointers for an, an idea about Mediterranean design, forgetting the particular religion related problems, we will be escaping problems, central problems. The Great Inner Sea witnessed the birth of the so called religion of the book, religions of the book. The books, I, I say scriptures, books, regardless of the holistic spiritual proposition, address also normative views about the world, natural and artificial. <laughs> Not trying to discuss the legitimacy of an idea of God that each one carries, we must try to demonstrate a relegation proposition uh, that relegates things and, and the, the proposition that the normative relation, the religion carries carries out conduces to the annihilation of free spirit of things and things are what designers must <coughs> think about. I must speak to you now about something very located. I don't know if you know of a Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa. He spoke of, of something he called the Fifth Empire. And this Fifth Empire was the Empire of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was the spirit, the idea of spirit, with nothing more, spirits. Something that we call, we could call parallel to material culture, the total of all immaterial culture. So, let's go on. Uh, Mediterranean people are prisoners. The apparent joyful freedom of our human relations and our meals, music and celebrations are merely testimonies of our human reaction to the structures that subducted the string of our myths, ghosts and spirits. <coughs> The stool that we are talking about stands for that resilience of spirit against religion. I told you, Lentes and they are atheists. Now it's time to be heretic. The idea of a God that tells stories and laws to be written is silly. God, as defined by the very so-called book religions, has so many voices that never could be represented by normative language. The stool from Lentes is a whisper from God. All the early scriptures are heresies perpetrated by power-driven people that misinterpreted the whispers from the most evident manifestations of God's discourse, nature and imagination. We all know that regardless of all restatements of the books under the written shape of our religions, still lives the essence of the spirit of things. Design on the Mediterranean region must face this primeval question. As long we believe on the written words of our God interpreters, we'll be maintaining secretly, ambiguously, a common ground of understanding that believes on the true individual spiritual value of things produced by humans in respect of the essence of nature interpreted by human imagination. The density of forms was generated in a time that nature was so full of decisive meaning and producing objects was always of spiritual significance. Making shapes was therefore conditioned by multiple formal grammars, developed to assure the veracity along with the utility of an object both in supernatural system as in functional systems. Being sacred or damned, all human actions were supported by objects. The education of form was a result of the education of spirit, thus defining good and true forms and evil and mistruthful forms. The nature of differences and the limits of authenticity. Sustained by three legs, the stool can be evidently a metaphor for the three great book religions. Nevertheless, it's too much simple and evident. The question that the example of the stool raises is what should be the characteristics of a Mediterranean design. <coughs> no one would argue that Mediterranean, the Mediterranean authenticity of the stool, mostly because it is an artifact developed by a Mediterranean people with Mediterranean materials. 
the variety of formal solutions preserves the model, but we all know that although deeply designed, the tool is not designed. Thinking of design objects generated by the same principles will be a challenge. Authentic objects able to express differences, multiplicity, geographically located. The peril lies on objects that will express only formal surfaces without careful contemplation of its generating rules. The danger is that Mediterranean design will transform our production into a giant souvenir shop. So, maybe we, go, we must go back to the time when every form had a spirit. Thank you. Italian academic community with an impressive international record in teaching, writing, and curating, and a special and long lasting <laughs> interest in Mediterranean issues. Rani, please. I am the last speaker today, <clears throat> but after me, I have to speak Nirit uh, and Nilo. <laughs> it means that I am not the charge of the conclusion <laughs> and I am very happy about that because it's very hard, it would be very hard to have conclusion after these two days that were very rich, very interesting and for which I really thanks Nirit and Lido. you know when uh, Usually a speaker has to say, I thank people who invited me and things like that. Sometimes it's correct. Sometimes you say thanks, but <laughs> it was a bore. <laughs> In this case, there are two days really rich and important, I must say. And I try to explain at the end of my speech why I think they are important. I thank Ido and Nirit, I thank, thank all, all the staff here that helped us so well. I help, uh, thank Gilad, no, the name is Gilad, not Gilad. <laughs> Without Gilad, I, I couldn't have my presentation. I thank uh, Beverly, who sent me about 200 letters. <laughs> but the problem is not that, the problem is that when I came from the airport, the taxi driver received a call by Beverly. And he asked to me, do you know Beverly? And they said, oh yes, I received 200 letters. <laughs> and he said, 400 to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Yaeli, she gave me a swimming... Yeah, really. Uh, otherwise, I could have a bath in, uh, in, the, in the sea, in the Bad Sea, as uh, Eduardo said. <laughs> now, I'm glad also, it's not rhetoric, believe me, I am glad also to be in Jerusalem, that it's a town that I really love. I think it's one of the best uh, towns in the world. I like Jerusalem, I like many things of Jerusalem, I'm not going on making the list. I'll try to explain some ideas that I had after so many speeches. In reality, I had a relation. It was written. It was also published one month ago, exactly about the same topic. And I thought uh, I will read it or something like that. But I can't, because uh, came out so many suggestions and so many problems that I like better not to read my relation, but to say uh, my impressions. You must understand that it's not easy for me, and I am angry with me for my awful English. Anyway, I'll try to, uh, to explain me in a better way. As Ido said, I teach history and theory of design. It means that uh, I must speak of theory. But I, I can assure you I won't speak about history. Because after my friend Eduardo, 
history we can give up with history. <laughs> and also uh, about, uh, about Eduardo. Eduardo is Portuguese. And we, in these days, discussed, but why you are Portuguese and you think so much, love so much to be Mediterranean? What is the relation? It's so cold uh, seeing the Portuguese. Now, now I can understand. So much history for a stool only from a Mediterranean guy. <laughs> Now I'll try to, to start from some statement that were made at the beginning for saying which, uh, which of them I agree and which of them I would like to discuss. First, we started with a wonderful relation by Mrs. Genio about the idea, the Mediterranean idea. I liked it very much, because the accent was put, that I think that we must put, uh, put the accent about the contradiction. The Mediterranean is a country, is a country, is a region, is an area in which we must not forget that contradictions are now and have always been. The Mediterranean, Mediterranean region is not a country, not a country, an area in which sometimes there was harmony, dialogue, uh, and things like that. Yes, we can find period in which it happened. But we can find a lot of period in which it did not happen at all. So, Mediterranean region has two problems, from my point of view. One is that, that it's very difficult to define what it is. Look at Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, uh, in Italy now we have a lot of uh, meeting about uh, uh, Mediterranean theater, Mediterranean movies and so, and there are uh, Mauritania, Iran. But, but as Mrs. Gino said, uh, a, a Jewish uh, scholar, Gottlieb, Goita, Goitan, said that uh, Iran can, uh, uh, like, uh, so it's impossible to define what is it. It's something like, uh, in Italy, I, I would say a phantasmatic <coughs> concept. Phantasmatic comes from phantasma, from phantom. Something that is very difficult to grasp, very difficult to define. The second thing, and I thank Silva <coughs> today to have uh, remembered that to us, it's a area rich of contradiction. And I insist so, so on that uh, topic because at the end I will come back about that. It means something for us, something for us not as designers, something for us as intellectuals. I still think that designers are intellectuals. Not everybody agree, but <laughs> I still <laughs> insist about that. The second question, is that uh, Ido, in his introduction, said, I speak about design, and I think that design is a comprehensive concept that includes also craftsmanship. I, I think we must discuss about it, because if I say design, of course I can say that design includes craftsmanship, because design doesn't mean other than project. So, if I project, I can project for an industrial production or for a craftsmanship production. But design <laughs> is a term that was used always with another term together. So, we always spoke about industrial design, about furniture design, about glasses design, about car design. So, the question, uh, the problem is a little more difficult. But, it's not that the problem for me. The real problem for me is that what is the meaning that we want to go to that world? So now, you, you know that we Italian, Portuguese love history. We like etymology. <laughs> if you read Italian philosopher Cacciare, all is uh, built about etymology. I want to address two etymological questions about design. 
because they can help us in something that uh, it's useful for go on. The first concept is that design means project, I told before. And project, etymologically, comes from Latin and means gettare ultra. It means uh, throw forward. Throw forward. So it means that uh, progettare means the opposite of the repetition. It means to throw away our ideas, our uh, sentiments, our soul, our body, but we don't make exactly what we, we made before. Craftsmanship means ex exactly the opposite. Crafton, we like craftsmanship exactly because it's went <coughs> in the centuries repeating exactly the same models with little variation and based on tradition, not on uh, the idea of going on. I must remember that I discussed with Tagul today a table about something like that. I refer you about that because it was a nice discussion. You know, in this meeting, one of the best things is the discussion at the restaurant. <laughs> when the restaurant is a good one, of course. <laughs> The other uh, etymological mean, meeting, uh, meaning of design, yeah, uh, etymology for me is important. It's a little boring, I you know, but uh, it's important. <laughs> it's that design comes from disegno. That's an Italian word. Disegno, in the Renaissance, was a very important word because there was a big discussion about it. And uh, in the 15th century, Disegno was theorized with two meanings. Not one mean, two meanings. There was an author, the name was Cennino Cennini, that wrote a wonderful book about that, introducing two ideas. There are two designs, of, no, there are two disegno. One disegno is mental, it's a mind design, it's a mental design. <laughs> It's what we today, and we uh, designers know very well that, we would call, would call concept. In the Renaissance, it meant that for designing, you have an idea of what you want to do. You must have in your mind an idea of your project. The external project, the outside project, is the other project that is important, the same. Because this is the con uh, it means that you have the control of the techniques. Techniques of drawings, techniques of building, techniques of everything. So, Renaissance is exactly the split with the tradition of the craft. I'll try to be more uh, clear. If you suggest that for designing, you must have a mental idea, that's the opposite of uh, thinking that designing is something that you uh, have uh, taught by your father, by your grandfather, the, by the father of your grandfather, because it's uh, a knowledge that in the century go on uh, on the familiar line. In that meaning, disegno is an intellectual work. In the Renaissance, the painters, the artists, let's say now the designer, become intellectual. And it was so clear, now I make some history, but after I give up, <laughs> it was so clear that when uh, there was the first and founding discussion about design and craftsmanship, it was in 19th century in England, why they called themselves pre-Raphaelites. Pre there was a group of painters that called themselves, Dante Gabriele Rossetti, Edward Baron Jones, called themselves pre-Raphaelites, just because they said that the spontaneous uh, link between the artist and the people 
was destroyed by the introduction of uh, the rationalism and the, of the conceptualization of art in the Renaissance. And William Morris, that was the man who tried to use uh, the craftsmanship against the industry, was friend of the Pre-Raphaelites, not only because his furniture, you know that uh, William Morris said that Everybody has to have the beauty, and uh, that uh, art should have uh, been uh, uh, <coughs> <my> English. <laughs> Everybody should have a part in the art and see things like that. And he had, uh, he made wonderful uh, furniture on medieval models because he wanted to start before the Renaissance, so on uh, uh, medieval. Uh, models, and he said uh, he had this friend, Edward Van Jones, that was a painter of the Pre-Raphaelites, who painted this uh, furniture. So he, made, uh, he said that everybody should have his, uh, not like Andy Warhol, his 15 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> but his good furniture. The only problem is that uh, a handmade furniture of William Morris, painted by Edward Van Jones, was so, costed so much that nobody could buy them. So it was a, a strong socialist idea because you know that what William Morris was a friend of Engels and things like that, made big uh, speech in uh, uh, speaking about uh, craftsmanship, but his, uh, his, uh, his furniture was uh, extremely expensive. And, uh, on, about that, I must say a third thing. It's not that I don't like craftsmanship. Maybe I don't like so much craftsmanship. <laughs> I think that we, the discussion about uh, industrial design or design and craftsmanship is a typical <coughs> discussion of the 19th and of the 20th century. Today, it's not a problem of uh, industrial design or uh, craftsmanship. Today, the problem is more complex. We we'll try to say something about this. For example, I told you about Targudi. There is Targudi here, I don't see him. No? Ah, yeah. Uh, we were at a restaurant. And he was very happy to tell to me that in Japan they made some, I don't know the English expression for the, the place in which they put the Indians, the Native Americans. They, we say reserve. Reserve. In, uh, in Japan, they made something that it's like, don't get angry now. <laughs> they make something like the reserve for uh, the craftsman. <coughs> <laughs> and they come back uh, where they worked before. And I'm very glad to work in that situation, receive money from the state. And uh, there are also designers that uh, uh, for two or three years, I, I presume, of their life, decide to go and work there. In Italy, for example, after the 70s, in the 70s there was the big political conflict uh, and so on. A lot of uh, leftists like me, but I don't like country, a lot of went, uh, went, uh, went uh, in the countries and make uh, milk with cow and all that horrible <laughs> things. So in uh, Japan, they make this reserve of craftsmanship. The problem, I'm joking with Tark uh, now, of course. The problem is, is that, a bit, uh, is that a way to preserve really uh, craftsmanship? Or is that a way to make, <laughs> yeah. Uh, some products that when that uh, are sold on the international market very in a very expensive way because they are original, they are authentic, they are uh, handmade. What I want to say is that now we are in a situation in which globalization means two things for me, not one. One of the two things was that so well Ellen Lipton yesterday demonstrates. 
Ikea, Coca-Cola, and we can go on. Now, IBM, uh, that's bought by a China industry and so on. But there is another kind of globalization that we are living. It's what we could call a soft ethnicity. Can I see ethnicity? <coughs> it's the problem that you can buy in New York Italian oil, Italian wine, maybe mozzarella, I say it's silver, <laughs> or uh, a lot of things. That one, it was impossible to buy far from the, the place or the country where they were made. Now you can find everything in all the world, especially if it's a big town and you have money enough, because they cost a lot of money. So there are, there are product, mass product, characterized, characterized by uh, mannerism, stylism, and things like that. Think about the minimalism that so well Tafik showed uh, yesterday. This uh, <laughs> international style, elegant, typical of the fashion showroom, or also of the houses of the stylist, of the fashion designer. That's one way of the globalization. The other way is that to make everybody with money enough to can buy also horrible uh, things sometimes. For example, I hate sushi, but <laughs> it's impossible. Then the last now it's a little uh, fading, but in the last 15 years it was impossible in Europe not go for a meeting like that. And after they said, let's go to a sushi bar. And you say, no, please, I want a pizza. <laughs> OK. We have a vegetarian meeting. Ah, yes, thanks. I like very much vegetarian. <laughs> so, after this, uh, how long is it? The last? Four nine, four nine. Ah, no, now I wanted to show you some slides. Be, be quiet. They were 80 and are 80 inside, as Gilad knows. But uh, we um, are, um, I show you about 25. It's true. And uh, I'll show you quickly because they were another relation what I thought at the beginning to do. So uh, now I'll use that only for uh, some consideration. Good, thanks. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, I think that I had to say before, as uh, that, uh, Ido, in his uh, um, introduction yesterday, said that we had met in Genova uh, one month ago, more or less, for a meeting called May Design. May Design means exactly Mediterranean design. And uh, uh, it was in uh, a work of the Italian University of Design about this topic of Mediterranean design, and we arrived at the end at a little exhibition at, at some meeting in Genoa, and we met there. So these, uh, some of these pictures are now taken from that uh, exhibition. But what I must add is uh, that, reflect on that, one month ago there was a the meeting about Mediterranean <coughs> design in general. Today we are here enjoying a meeting about Mediterranean design in uh, Jerusalem. Maybe that this problem, the Mediterranean design, it's really a real problem. It's not an academic invention. It's something that has sense and that's worthwhile to discuss about that. So, I want to show you the works of two Arab designers that represent the other side of the moon about what Matteo spoke two days ago. 
Because well, not two days ago. Yesterday, yeah, two days ago. <laughs> really heavy meeting. Uh, Matteo spoke of uh, nomads and of very uh, uh, traditional things and way of life, uh, objects of all the day life. And it was very interesting because uh, there were the usual fascination that we have toward uh, this kind of life, and also the discovering that under the tent, that's one, that wonderful tent, there were Samsonite bags and uh, plastic uh, bags and things like that. <coughs> that's another question about globalization. So, uh, he spoke about the spontaneous, we can say, tradition of uh, that kind of life. Here we have uh, two designers. This one uh, is uh, fr both from uh, Alger. This one, the name is uh, Abdi Abdelkader. And I know, uh, show you two or three things. This uh, is clearly a table of traditional, but not spontaneous, of traditional and rich tradition. After he showed this one, in reality he showed 40 pictures, but I, after he showed this one, and it was very interesting because looking at that I, saw, I said, but that looks Macintosh. Where uh, did you study Macintosh? And he said, but I studied the Academy de Beaux Arts. <laughs> yeah, but we are laughing about it, but we sometimes forget that in all, uh, the North Africa, the influence of the French culture through the Académie des Beaux-Arts, or generally the school, it was very, very strong. So we are not, we are not discussing of the North Africa in which the nomads are the paradigm. The nomads are the nomads, but the paradigm of the designer is the Académie des Beaux-Arts. So they are informed, they have studied liberty here they go. And they know Macintosh and mix up some jokes on Macintosh. Like that. On which, always referring to Macintosh, introduce something that can remember windows or uh, things like that of the Arab culture. But the problem is that after uh, our friend goes to Paris and make Learn things like that. That means that he has seen Nepre uh, General Alchemia, Memphis. I'm sorry for people who don't know the history of Italian history. But we, when we Italian, when we speak of design, we are sure that everybody knows Italian history of design. Anyway, and after, he designed things like that. That, it's something we were discussing before, for Alessi. It's uh, very clever. It demonstrates exactly what I was saying. There are pieces for a mass uh, market, international market, and there is a, a soft ethnicity in which a traditional way of cooking with uh, in aluminium and with the, or uh, steel, I don't remember, and with the half moon on the top, become an icon of the Arab culture. So it can be sold in all the shops uh, in the Fifth Avenue, for example, because it's Alessi with the half moon of Alessi. Under the crescent moon. Under the crescent moon. And this is another piece of uh, <laughs> that guy that I show to you because it's a good designer. I'm joking, but it's not, uh, nobody, there are, it's not so easy to work for Alessi. Uh, he makes lumps like that, not the legs. Because the legs can... Uh, but it, this is the other design. The other design, the name of the other design is uh, Yahui Mohammed. And the design things like that in which you see uh, something of the Arab tradition, something of the Liberty Arteco tradition, but in reality, yeah, you more than make after that, make, not sorry, make that, make Philip Stark. 
<laughs> so you understand how from uh, the, 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 the links of start with the French culture, the French, they call liberty, and how Arabs designer going from Algeria to Paris enter in the mass in the international market and became get that mannerism mm -hmm. that can be minimalism or can be stark that allow to uh, be present on the international market. That's globalization. And that I'm not criticizing it. I'm only saying that this is uh, something that when we speak about Mediterranean, must not forget. Otherwise, we think that in the Mediterranean there are countrymen with their traditional culture and after this modern design. No, there is liberty, as they call tradition, eh? all the, think about all the 19th century uh, in France and so on. And uh, the very nice thing, thing is that Yamo, that is Yahui Mohamed, Explain, uh, told us uh, it's a nice guy and it's I think really it's a good design uh, that he understood that if he said that his name was Yahui Mohamed the success is not so easy so he made Yamo and making Yamo he had a big success uh, he told me because everybody thought that it was Japanese <laughs> because Yamo is Japanese what is the uh, the nice side of uh, globalization? I'm not thinking about globalization. I'm not more of this. I think that we must study globalization. I think that we in general must study. Another very interesting thing that the Mrs. Genio said at the beginning was stop with the stereotypes. Let's study if, in the reality what sucks, uh, what happens in this country. She said that, I presume, under a historical point of view, uh, political, uh, we can say that by, under a design point of view. Let's see, re uh, in the reality, what happens there. Let's go quickly. Ah, that's the Yamo, and it's uh, nice. I think it's nice. I don't know exactly if they are lamp or uh, stool. Uh, maybe both. But, but, but the, the image is nice. After, yeah, <coughs> Spain. I don't know, I, I must be fast. It, really, they were organized for another. I like this uh, lamp from a, this a Spain designer. I like this hanger from a Turkish designer, from an Italian uh, company. You know that? 50% of uh, designer furniture lamps of design in the world is made in Italy. One of the characteristic of design in Italy is that designers are fading. There are, uh, but the industry works with the designer all over the world. So if you look at the Italian catalog, you see that the most of the designers are not Italian. <laughs> That's uh, Italian designer are angry about that. <laughs> this is an Israeli designer in Rome. And this is uh, imaging in Czech. Just for saying how the, the idea design now is going in all the country. And look, it's interesting this idea of uh, connecting with the still wire intention. This is uh, an exhibition I made in uh, Verona many years uh, four or five years ago. And was the first time with Giulio Capellini we exposed some pieces of Israeli design. For me, it was a uh, very interesting, a little surprise. That's what, uh, that's why I say that Mrs. Genio is right when he say, let's see exactly what is happening in different countries. I didn't know what it was happening in uh, Israeli uh, design. And uh, if you look at the piece on the left, this idea of taking an umbrella and transforming it in a lamp, it's something that in some way, it's one of the concepts most important and most uh, uh, developed 
in the design all over the world. I mean, the idea, yes, but um, don't say name now, but let's not say them, nothing. No, when I say that all over the world, I say that it's in Brazilian. It's a Brazilian, uh, and inside that, uh, there are rubber tires for car. So, one of the idea, one of the concepts, I think now it's most interesting, and it's very well developed in the new young design in the Mediterranean area, is the idea of uh, experimentation, we could say. It's an idea that not refuse the industrial design. It's uh, with the, I know, not with all, but with the most of them, if I say uh, Volkswagen, will call you for, uh, they are happy. It's not an ideological position like it was 20 years ago. Now it's an idea to work on the border. I can say, uh, experimenting, <coughs> trying, and so on. And this idea of taking things that already exist and transforming their use, sometimes mixing together, sometimes making uh, things like Achille Castiglioni, an Italian designer made many years ago, putting together different components, has uh, an ethic uh, inside very interesting. Achille Castiglioni said, I don't know how, if you know Achille Castiglioni, Achille Castiglioni was a, a designer that in the 50, in the 60, till now, he's dead uh, two years ago, made part of his uh, projects were made of uh, components of other things, uh, already existing on the market. The idea was that the technique is so much, so diffused, there is so much technique that why use a special technique to make a thing that when can be assembled with things that already exist? All this idea, I think that now we have in the Mediterranean, but all over the world, a lot of young designers working, putting together things that already exist, or transforming the use of them. Another idea, uh, quickly. This is an Italian designer that redesigned, you know what they are? Yes. It's the idea of working uh, on uh, little things. The, the idea that the design can work on uh, little things, it's not important to work always of uh, big things. It's an idea light of the design. An idea in some way not so far from the things we have, sown, have seen by Kaufman, for example. And in some way also far from far Silva, from Silva in New York. An idea that it's possible to make design working lightly with the poor materials many times and going on uh, without exhibit the idea of design and what you are doing. I like that. That is another thing that is from Lebanon. And on Lebanon, they have the um, use, of, uh, you know, the Mediterranean country, we use uh, herbs also too much. Uh, so the designer redesigned these little vases with different kind of herbs and with a, a wood table that Made it, make it possible to take it at, uh, on the table when you when you are. I like it very much. It's from Turkey. Uh, listen, I am trying to show you a lot of things about Mediterranean and not only that demonstrate a way of making design that today I think has a concept inside or some concept inside uh, clear. I like very much industrial design. And the designer that today were uh, uh, La pa Paz, his name. Yeah, I, well, I appreciate very much his work, and I think we must not forget that design is all, uh, also industrial production, that it's useful for the life of the people. 
But in, uh, and he said uh, before to me, yes, because I was a little disoriented, because all the things were so academic. And he, are, he is right. We, we must be, for other meeting, we must remember that. This is from Tartica Fick, and it's a genius thing, I think. It's a bottle that has a pocket for the eyes. So you can put the tea, the, wa the water, the wine, and you can have it uh, cold without the terrible habit of putting ice in, inside the wine. That it's a typical Mediterranean country habit. That's why I, I say that it's impossible to drink the wine made uh, from the countrymen. Did you already saw it yesterday? It's from Spain. These are things from Spain. I go on quickly. This is a Zua that invent something like a light habitation, a light home. And this is a girl that invents a way to make <coughs> a suit starting from, the, from a piece of fabric. This is an Italian that some years ago made a lamp with a bottle of plastic. This is a fantastic uh, Indian that lives in Brussels and made that with Capellini in Italy, starting from a old tradition of uh, carving iron wire in India. And it's very nice, but it, it was impossible to produce it. No, it was impossible, really. And this is from Australia, made with uh, that kind of grass, I don't remember the name that you find in the sea. And this is from uh, Holland. And this cube is uh, on, uh, made with the same technique of lace but it's rigid with an epoxidic resin, resin, I don't remember. It's a typical example of putting an old tradition of uh, technique working with a very advanced. I stop with that. And uh, I don't know, I can, uh, if you want, I can. <laughs> No, I can't stop. I, you are right. I forget. The, I forget two things. Uh, I make a mistake. No, but there are uh, two or three. Why I show that? Because we think always that from between local and global, there is a problem that we are living. But between local and global, the problem is uh, always. There is a neurotic problem that is uh, uh, going... Uh, Mar Karl Marx, Karl Marx uh, became a book saying there is a phantom in the Europe and it was a for working class. Now there is a phantom in the world and there is the problem of identity. Last time I, wa I went in uh, Brazil, I found out that a friend of mine, a very rich Italian sociologist, uh, very famous, got a lot of money. Domenico De Masi, it's, uh, the name is uh, known and it's, uh, I can say it because it's public got a lot of money from a big association, Brazilian so association, for making a study with the goal of defining the Brazilian identity. <laughs> and I said, Ma, why you are taking an Italian scholar for that? <laughs> and I said, so it's better. <laughs> and I said, Ma, why you want uh, to understand so well that, but the, what is the Brazilian identity? I can say to you immediately, they are color, lights, and things like that, no? everybody, uh, but exactly the same of, of what Sicily, in people, people in Sicily think of his identity, uh, color, light, and things like that. Brazil, bra huh? no, I wanted to show, to show that. This and other two or three images of the same type, because there is a problem that we must not forget. And that problem came out also uh, by Ellen Lipton. At the end of Ellen Lipton, Ellen Lipton showed what? Graphic design. 
And uh, it came out that what really is changing in this moment is not so much the product design, but the graph design. I don't know exactly why. But uh, from the outcome of the computer, uh, with the new designers like David Carson, they theori theorized, theorized, theorized anarchy. And this kind of anarchy really is changing the design. This is a, a, a Spanish design. And you see that they made a new typography, a new alphabet. But if you look better, it's constructed with the aerial. Is the name is aerial? Yeah. Antenna, yeah. With aerial, TV aerial. But this TV aerial becomes something like A wire with the, uh, it's terrible, it, the name is incommunication. <laughs> but if it's happened in Spain, in Iran, I found out that there is a very good uh, graphic. For example, this idea of the new Iraqi flag, <laughs> I think it's uh, very nice. <laughs> and this is a poster for Hamlet. And this is a very strong contemporarity. I like it because my problem is how much craftsmanship, design or other, it's connected with our time. Because uh, I think as uh, a scholar, Matvejevich, that uh, Mrs. Genio quoted at the beginning, said something that it's important, I think. He said, Mediterranean area has a big history, but it's oppressed by his, what German, in German they would say historism. In Italy we would say historicism. I don't know if, uh, what in English is say. Historicism, yes. So, Mediterranean country are oppressed by their history. Their history is not a way for looking at the, to the future, to the project, but it's something that they have on their uh, shoulders and that make that they are always blocked in the same situation. Also this is, uh, and this is the last, and I like it, because here, there is also a very important concept, I suppose, because there is uh, this uh, mixing in uh, an iconic culture with the iconic culture. Uh, it was clear what I mean? No. Okay. Be there is a figure, and there, is, and there are letters. I think there is Farsi, the name of the... Um, the language in Iran, no? Farsi? We say Farsi in English. Farsi. So let's finish. Two things. First, I said at the beginning that it's important to understand that the Mediterranean is a country, it's a country, it's an area in which the problems are very strong. We must not forget about that. In, uh, at Genova, he insisted, Carlo and Nicola, that it's uh, here, uh, he, he was one of the most important organizers in Genova. I can also say that with, without Carlo, it was impossible to do that. With Carlo and Nicola, he insisted, because in the exhibition, they put a video of a video, an Israeli video artist, I don't, not rem don't remember the name. Because uh, otherwise, all this exhibition, in which there were objects, teapots, and uh, vases for flowers, uh, uh, furniture, and things like that, looked like a little uh, paradise of a, of, a, of a paradise. And we always say Mediterranean is a paradise. Okay, it's a paradise, but, but, there, but there are war. But there are, uh, for, for example, in Italy, one of the problems is how many people die 
from the boat, how uh, many me, immigrants? A country that many not, don't consider uh, Mediterranean, but in Europe it's considered Mediterranean, <laughs> officially is Mauritania. Uh, if you see the plan of European for the uh, 210, in which all the Mediterranean area should be in a commercial, a trade uh, area, or, uh, Mauritania is part of that. Mauritania, they make nice film. <coughs> also in Israel, you make nice film. Also in Iran, they make nice film. Mediterranean is, from my point of view, a situation in which now is much better. Literature, uh, graphic, uh, movies, music, all the experimentation, all the experimentation in fusion, in mixing different music, and much, much advanced that we are doing. Like, there is a very nice movie from Mauritania. The name is uh, uh, Waiting for Happiness, in which in this little village near the sand, near the beach, almost every morning when they get up, find on the beach a body, a corpse, a body of an immigrant that, was, uh, uh, that fell from a boat uh, and, and things like that. So I think that if we understand this problem, we understand that Genova, Jerusalem, other situation can be in few years something like a network of debate, of intellectual debate. And uh, uh, since the design as an intellectual activity, it uh, can be really what we can do like designer and like intellectual, we can do for the Mediterranean. The name of my uh, speech is Design in the Mediterranean Area, Design for the Mediterranean Area. Design in the Mediterranean Area is uh, what I said before. Let's study really exactly what is happening. And also it happens also with dialogue. But let what we can do for the Mediterranean Area. I can, like designer, I, I I imagine two things. One is that a network in which, in general, they had in mind to make every two years something that put together every year people to discuss about that. And it's not important how many people and how many countries will be present. Maybe that in general they will be more than in uh, Jerusalem, of course. There is no problem discussed about that. But if we every year uh, go on with this kind of, uh, of initiative, Initiative. initiatives, it can be, thanks, <laughs> that's why I like. <laughs> uh, that can be a very important thing, something that other people did not, did not people, uh, think to, to do. Another thing that I imagine that is possible to do is that we must go on, we must give up. With uh, an idea that designing only design products. I think that design, it's uh, also a way in which designer keep in contact with the companies with great industries, with the public institution, and uh, also with the work that we can do at the university, demonstrates that to design today, in what is called the third phase of industrial revolution, it's not possible to make the product and, and stop. But it was never so. Because when, when Peter Behrens, at the beginning of the century, worked for the IG, the big uh, German industry of electricity that was in competition with uh, the General Electric in the States and so on, Peter Bennett built the, uh, the building of the industry, the shops, the catalogs, uh, all that today we call corporate image. Yes, I think that designers are responsible. They can do Strategic design, we call it in Italy, it means uh, the tie with the industry, we can together discuss of what are the market, on which market it's possible to go, with what means, and 
we design all. Because now, in industry, in any way, whatever products needs to have a quality of uh, products, but of presentation, of communication, of places in which they sell. Eh? So, I think that from an uh, initiative like that, we can go on with other meeting, with other appointment, next time. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I hope to can enjoy myself next time as this time I did. Yeah, I have a few, a few things to say before the, I let me take over. Help, before she helps me, sorry. Uh, the first is I have to, I must, I can't help myself. I have to settle a little account with Vani about this uh, craft and design business. Uh, but I have an easy job because we have Ross Daly here and his little uh, Zen uh, legend from yesterday, or Zen story, I think uh, gave us a nice idea about tradition and creativity and uh, maybe about design. And I'll leave it at that. Um, the second issue has to do with the idea of conclusion, uh, which I think uh, Nate and I had a lot of thoughts, different thoughts about how to end this conference during the time before the conference. And I think last night, both of us understood that we, there's, there's going to be no conclusion because it's not something that can be concluded. Uh, I guess the whole thing is, a, is sort of an introduction. On the other hand, um, Maybe I'll, I'll quote uh, someone who studied with uh, Ami and with Daniel with me in our class, Nachshon, uh, who used to say that the situation is very complex. It's terribly complex. But then, it, you know, it's very simple too. So, and I think this is a very Mediterranean way of thought. And I think in this sense of complex and simple, the, the idea I identify with the most, uh, and Vani said it a few times, is that we have to um, always look at the objects themselves and what is being done and take the things from there. Um, last thing is that um, because so many provocations were spread around here, by, especially by Eduardo and Rani, uh, we don't have a choice. We have to invite everybody back here to answer them and give them what they you know. Uh -huh. I'd like to invite all the lecturers on stage, please. No. You smoked enough for the last two days, for the, the next year, Eduardo. That's it. 